This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome back to the latest compilation of this series, looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who viewing figures. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future installments, and check out our previous compilations. We've covered the entirety of the programme's original run on television, but now we're entering a darker time, for we're about to explore the prolonged era that was the wilderness years. The year is 1990, and for the first time in 27 years, a new series of Doctor Who was nowhere to be seen on television screens across the country. After the various trials and tribulations of the late 1980s, News that the show would not be immediately returning for the 1990s was confirmed first to leading stars Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred, and then to the press and public soon after. On the BBC's part, anticipating the backlash that had ensued when Michael Grade had tried to axe the show in 1985, the term cancellation wasn't utilised. Instead, the statement was that the show was resting, that it would have a few years off air and return to TV when the time felt right, or when a new, exciting direction had been found for the 1990s. So, Doctor Who was no more, right? Well, not exactly. Despite there being no new series on TV, Doctor Who was far from being all over. Over the next 15 years, the franchise would thrive in the form of a monthly magazine, countless book releases giving us new adventures and stories set with past Doctors, a steady stream of home video releases, countless new audio adventures, and so much more. Now, for the record, I won't be covering absolutely everything that came out during the wilderness years here in this one video. This is a series primarily about viewing figures after all, and despite their scarcity in this period, we'll touch on what we can. These include numerous repeats of classic adventures, which we have touched on briefly before, but I'll reference them with a little more depth. But rest assured, I won't be completely ignoring all the different pieces of expanded media that came out, as they were vital for ensuring Doctor Who's survival through the 1990s, the 21st century, and beyond. So, where shall we begin? Well, for those who were enthralled by the recent adventures of the Seventh Doctor and Ace, they actually didn't have to wait too long before they could be seen on TV again. On the 21st of November, 1990, less than a year since the concluding episode of Season 26, the Doctor, Ace, together with K-9 and new friend Cedric, appeared in Search Out Space, a special crossover with the children's educational program, Search Out Science. The Time Lord is the host of The Ultimate Challenge, the biggest game show in the universe, with his companions being tasked to answer questions about space, with severe punishments awaiting them should they answer incorrectly. Now, this is just a nice bit of fun. Sylvester and Sophie play this absolutely in character, and it's great to hear John Leeson voicing K-9 again, the first time he'd done so on TV since the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors. I searched high and low for the viewing figures of this little oddity, and sadly, no results have yielded themselves. Whilst I'm sure documents do exist, it's important to remember that not every programme's viewing figures are talked about as much as Doctor Who. Given that this was a children's programme, I can't imagine the numbers reached extraordinary heights. That's not a stab at the special's quality or children's TV in general, but it is known that children's programmes generally garner a fraction of the audience size of even the lowest performing drama, for example. Had Search Out Space, say, had roughly 1 million or just under that tuning in, I'd say that wouldn't be a bad result given the context. But despite the drought of new adventures, don't think that the past 26 years of Who on television simply went untouched. The home video market was growing from strength to strength with every passing year, with VCR decks becoming gradually more affordable to consumers. Doctor Who stories had been issued on the format since 1983, with a heavily edited compilation edition of Revenge of the Cybermen being the first release around the time of the 20th anniversary. Since then, VHS releases of Doctor Who had been limited to a few releases per year. However, starting from 1990, fans would see classic adventures be issued at a more consistent rate. Stories that saw a VHS release in 1990 are An Unearthly Child, The War Games, The Dalek Invasion of Earth, The Mind Robber, The Five Doctors, The Brain of Morbius, The Web Planet, and The Dominators. This year was mainly occupied by black and white adventures, giving many younger fans a chance to experience those 1960s stories for the very first time including the serial that started it all, and the ten-part epic that was the swan song for the black and white era. Suffice to say, if the Doctor and friends taking part in the ultimate challenge didn't meet your expectations, you were going to be waiting a fair while before you'd see any further adventures on your TV screen. Sure, you could enjoy a gradually expanding array of classic stories on VHS, but 1990 was coming to an end, and despite rumours flying about the fandom every other week, there was no concrete confirmation that Doctor Who was returning to BBC One. The year is now 1991, 
a year which arguably marked a turning point for Doctor Who, at least in terms of its expanded media. For nearly 20 years, alongside the TV series, novelised adaptations of those adventures had been consistently released under the Target Books label. Initially reprinting a trilogy of first Doctor adventures, which first hit shop shelves in 1973, the Target line and brand only grew from strength to strength, with Doctor Who being the crown jewel of its arsenal. However, as the 1990s rolled in, Target was quickly running out of television stories to adapt. Throughout 1990 and 1991, the last few Seventh Doctor adventures were novelised, as well as a few stories from the 1960s. The final regular release, The Pescatons, was an adaptation of a vinyl LP release from back in the mid-70s, so it's fair to say that available content to novelise was well and truly running dry. Target had attempted to release a line of original Who books back in the 1980s. The Companions of Doctor Who, as it was titled, saw brand new adventures for Vizelor Turlow, Harry Sullivan, and the Doctor's faithful dog, K9. Though this release was technically an adaptation of A Girl's Best Friend, the sole episode of attempted spin-off K9 and Company. Sadly, these releases didn't get a new strand of original adventures off the ground, but by 1991, times had changed, and if the Doctor and Ace's adventures weren't going to continue on TV, then they may as well continue in print. With Virgin Books taking on the task, the new adventures of Doctor Who first hit bookshops all across the country in the summer of 1991. Picking up where the TV series left off, the Seventh Doctor and Ace continued their travels in the Time Vern saga, setting the more serious, mature tone that these stories would become known for. Whereas the Target books had primarily been aimed at children, the Virgin New Adventures, or VNAs as they would become known, were geared towards older readers, some of them becoming infamous for their use of strong language and even sexual elements. The Time Worm saga was a hit, being released throughout the latter half of 1991 and would ensure that the range would continue into 1992 and beyond, keeping fans happy and intrigued by these brand new adventures whilst the future of Doctor Who on TV remained ever more a mystery. Meanwhile, in the world of home video, Doctor Who continued to expand the amount of releases fans could get their hands on in a year. The classic adventures to hit shop shelves in 1991 were The Curse of Fenric, The Crotons, Planet of the Spiders, City of Death, The Mask of Mandragora, The Three Doctors, The Deadly Assassin, and a twin pack comprising of the Sontaran Experiment and Genesis of the Daleks. Alongside these nine stories, there were also two extra VHS releases from the BBC. These were the Hartnell Years and the Troughton Years, special tapes that retrospectively looked at the early years of the programme, complete with select episodes and new linking material featuring Sylvester McCoy and John Pertwee respectively. 1991 would also mark the first year in which an extended edition of A Who Story would be released. The Curse of Fenric included several extra minutes of new material, proudly boasting so on the box art. It was the first time a Doctor Who story had received this treatment on home video, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. But as 1991 drew to a close, a prospective season 27 of the TV series was still very much a pipe dream. However, one summer's night, on the 26th of August, fans had been treated to a very special screening over on BBC Two. As part of the Lime Grove story, taking a look at the historic BBC studios, the pilot episode of Doctor Who was aired in tandem. This originally unaired piece of television had been recorded on the 27th of September 1963, and was absolutely ripped to pieces by Sidney Newman, head of drama at the time, and often credited as being one of the originators of Doctor Who as a whole. It's a fascinating piece of TV history, especially when considering that this version of an unearthly child could have been the one that made it to our screens. This noteworthy broadcast attracted an audience of around 1.6 million viewers. For 1991, this is quite a low figure, lower than any first broadcast of all existing Who stories up to this point, but I think there's a few factors that call for its defence. First off, the pilot aired on BBC Two, BBC One's sister channel that generally received lower viewership across the board. Second, by the turn of the 1990s, the incorporation of satellite television into people's homes was becoming far more common, offering them hundreds of new channels to dedicate their time to. Regardless of the viewing figures, this airing of the pilot episode marked the only Doctor Who repeat on terrestrial TV during 1991. However, the following year would prove to be significantly more rewarding in terms of repeat transmissions. The year is now 1992, and the year got off to an exciting start for Whovians, as a new series of repeats began airing over on BBC Two, covering a story from the first three Doctor's eras. First up was The Time Meddler, the concluding serial of Season 2, and one that had been considered missing for decades, only being returned to the BBC in 1985. This was the first time the story was to be seen on TV since its original broadcast back in 1965, and as it wasn't yet available on VHS, it was quite the occasion for fans, as many of them would be seeing it for the very first time. 
airing on Friday evenings from the 3rd to the 24th of January 1992, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 2.59 million viewers. Whilst this is a near 6 million drop from its first transmission back in 1965, I would argue that for 1992, and for Doctor Who's standing amongst the general public at the time, this is a surprisingly decent figure to average. Given that it features no major monsters, for nearly 3 million viewers to tune into a story that hadn't been seen on British TV for nearly 30 years is quite the feat. I'm sure many watching were died in the wool Who fans, but I could also imagine sections of the general public could have been curious at the very least. Not to mention the competition from other terrestrial channels and satellite television to boot. Also, we have to take note of the chart positions, with three of the serial's four episodes gaining a place within the top 20, with part two just missing out, finishing up at 21st. Whilst this may seem like a triumph, you've probably sussed out that these positions don't take into account all of the terrestrial channels available, these merely being the placements for BBC Two programmes. Nevertheless, for a 27-year-old Doctor Who story to firmly root itself within the top 20 BBC Two programmes of that week surely asserts that the franchise wasn't completely dead in the water yet. Whilst repeat screenings were a great opportunity for fans and newcomers alike, there were many who were still clamouring for new adventures. They could happily rely on the output of Virgin Books, which released six new stories compared to the previous year's four, all of which continued the travels of the Seventh Doctor, with several major shakeups along the way. A new trilogy kicked off the year with Cat's Cradle, before standalone stories followed, with Nightshade, Love and War, and Transit. These three books are notable for a few reasons, not least for taking into account who wrote them. Nightshade was penned by Mark Gattis, who would go on to become a writer for the revival of Doctor Who, as well as a successful actor in his own right. Transit was written by Ben Aronovich, the writer behind Remembrance of the Daleks and Battlefield. And finally, we have Love and War, written by relative newcomer Paul Cornell. Having concluded the Time Verm saga the previous year, Paul was proving to be one of the most popular new writers amongst fans. In this adventure, he created the character of Bernice Summerfield, who had gone to travel with the Doctor before eventually starring in her own book series and later countless audio dramas, but that's a little way off in the future, so more on that when we get there. The repeat season continued, with the Mind Robber being chosen to represent the second Doctor's tenure. One of the early stories from season 6, this five-part adventure is often heralded as being one of the era's best, with a strong imaginative landscape and the leads absolutely lapping up every bit of its inherent obtuseness. Going out over five Friday evenings from the 31st of January to the 28th of February 1992, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 2.33 million viewers, a 0.26 million decrease from the previous serial. Now, when we take a look at the raw numbers, we can see there's a noticeable dip in viewership with episodes 3 and 4, both of which pulling in roughly 1.5 million. The lower audience could be put down to a later time slot for transmission. Due to BBC Two's coverage of the Winter Olympics in Albertville, France, Episodes 3 and 4 went out almost an hour later than the serial's other parts, at around 7.40pm. There's no direct evidence to suggest that this is the prime factor, but I would argue that it's the most likely one, especially given that Episode 5 gained the highest viewership of the adventure's repeat, at 3.46 million. In terms of chart placements, whilst data for Episodes 3 and 4 are unavailable, we can see that the remaining instalments all reach BBC Two's top 20 programmes for their respective weeks. Part 5 in particular is able to reach the top 10, but only just. Again though, keep in mind all the potential competition from other channels, for a 24 year old Doctor Who story to get repeated and gain a top 10 placement, I'd argue that isn't to be sniffed at. Meanwhile, as the expanded media of the VNAs continued to grow from strength to strength, the VHS range of Classic Who continued to regularly release stories, at an even more rapid rate. The selection of adventures fans could purchase on video throughout 1992 included The Caves of Androzani, Robot, Logopolis, Castrovalva, the Claws of Axos, The Twin Dilemma, Earthshock, The Aztecs, and Mordrin Undead. These standard releases were accompanied by the Pertwee Years, Tom Baker Years, and now also special tapes dedicated to the program's most iconic monsters. The Daleks and Cybermen had their earliest moments issued as part of the Years series, but as interesting as these special releases were, there were two more from 1992 that really got fans talking. Firstly, you had the abandoned Season 17 finale, Sharda which had originally been scheduled for broadcast back in 1980. Using a combination of shot footage and new linking material featuring Tom Baker, the story finally saw the light of day, with its VHS release also including a copy of all six scripts. This was the first attempt to complete a Doctor Who adventure, and despite seeming quite simple by today's standards, it established a benchmark, and certainly wouldn't be the last of its kind. But the most exciting VHS release of 1992 arguably had to be of the Season 5 opener, The Tomb of the Cybermen. Originally having been broadcast in 1967, 
The serial was never repeated in the UK, and for several decades was believed to be one of many adventures from the 1960s to be deemed lost, with no surviving copies remaining in the BBC's archive or any archive of several international broadcasters. However, all of that changed at the start of 1992 when copies of all four episodes were found in Hong Kong. Mere months later, the story was issued on VHS, becoming one of the best-selling tapes of the entire range. Back on TV, the last of the spring repeats for 1992 would be The Sea Devils, a season 9 adventure that would represent the third Doctor's time on the telly. Going out across six Friday evenings from the 6th of March to the 10th of April 1992, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 3.2 million viewers, a 0.9 increase from the previous serial. It's great to see the viewership of these repeats increase as time rolls on, particularly for such a belter of a story as The Sea Devils. All six episodes pull in over 3 million viewers, not too shabby at all for a 20-year-old adventure. Each episode also is able to find a place within the top 20 BBC2 programmes for their respective weeks, with episode 4 coming the closest to reaching the top 10, finishing at 12th place. So what was it about the Sea Devils that helped it triumph over the previous two repeats? Well, this may sound somewhat shallow, but this was the first of the spring repeat season stories to be filmed and shown in colour. Believe it or not, there are viewers out there who don't enjoy black and white telly, for numerous reasons. Furthermore, amongst the casual viewer base, John Pertwee remained one of the most recognisable Doctors at that time, being the first Doctor for millions of children who were now in their adulthood. Finally, the presence of the Sea Devils themselves surely sparked some memories amongst the British public. Several fans and non-fans alike retell the story of when they saw the creatures emerging from the sea, how that was for many their earliest encounter and memory of Doctor Who. But regardless of which of these reasons could be the leading factor, it is great to see that some enthusiasm could still be drummed up for the TARDIS teams of old, especially with seemingly endless amounts of competition that could have drawn those viewers away. And with the conclusion of the Sea Devils, so marked the end of the 1992 spring season of Doctor Who repeats. By combining the average results from the three stories, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for this season of repeats stands at around roughly 2.7 million viewers. Whilst these may be far from the five faces of Doctor Who, back in 1981, these three adventures I'd argue pack a decent punch given the limbo the TV series was in by 1992. The Sea Devils was the clear winner, but for the Hartnell and Troughton tales to still pull in over 2 million viewers despite their age and being in monochrome is a small victory all to itself. With the wealth of material available to fans throughout 1992, there was one last little surprise to help seal off the year. Another story was scheduled for a repeat transmission over on BBC2, the season 8 finale The Demons being the lucky candidate. Arguably one of the most popular serials of the John Pertwee era, amongst both fans and cast alike, but why now was it slated for this one-off re-airing? Well, for many years, all but one episode of The Demons existed in just black and white, as opposed to the colour it was originally shot in. However, thanks to new restoration techniques of the time, the colour signal from American recordings was used as the basis to help restore the original colour in the black and white telerecordings held here in the UK. Therefore, the demons could be showcased to British audiences in colour for the first time in over 20 years. Quite an exciting achievement, one which was publicised well with a segment on the restoration appearing on Tomorrow's World and extensive continuity announcements and trailers leading up to the repeats transmission. Going out over five consecutive Fridays from the 20th of November to the 18th of December 1992, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 2.5 million viewers, a 0.7 decrease from the previous repeat back in the spring. Whilst only one episode of The Demons is able to just about crack the 3 million mark, the rest of the serial holds firmly above 2 million, with each episode gaining a spot within the top 30 charts for BBC2 programmes, all except for episode 3, for which no data can be found. So, how come this repeat didn't turn out to be the most successful of the bunch in 1992, especially given the restoration back to colour? It's all speculation of course, but I think the time of year didn't do the serial any favours. This repeat was originally meant to begin in early September, but was pushed back to November, which meant it would air through December, which is the busiest time of year for television, as that's when all the festive programming begins. And if you thought competition was rife throughout the rest of the year, well, at Christmas it's overwhelming and with the wealth of new programmes available during the holiday season, a 20-year-old Doctor Who repeat, no matter how impressive regarding the restoration, was simply not going to cut it for vast chunks of the viewing public. Still, regardless of the somewhat anticlimactic impact, the Demon's repeat performed just as well as the other adventures re-screened that year. And if you thought 1992 was a solid year for repeats, just wait until we get to 1993. But of course, those repeats were just regarding terrestrial television. 
Believe it or not, satellite television would welcome Doctor Who with open arms, specifically the UK TV network, which was originally formed via a collaboration between Thames Television and none other than the BBC. Launching on the 1st of November 1992, the original standalone channel, UK Gold, would be a host to several classic British programmes, one of which would go on to become one of their best performers on the channel, that of course being Doctor Who. On the new channel's second day, the 2nd of November 1992, at 5.30pm, viewers could tune in to a repeat showing of the very first episode, An Unearthly Child. For almost every day thereafter, the show would be broadcast in story order, with both episodic and omnibus editions of most classic adventures being screened to audiences. With satellite dishes becoming a more common appearance on UK households, these showings on UK Gold provided many of you with their very first Doctor Who experience. These repeats would continue on UK Gold in heavy rotation throughout the 1990s, lasting into the 2000s, and even past the show's revival in 2005. The very last repeat transmission would be of John Pertwee's swan song, Planet of the Spiders, presented in an omnibus edition going out on Sunday the 14th of April 2007. Doctor Who would continue to live on the UK TV network, moving over to Gold's sister channel, UK TV Drama, but for 15 years, particularly during the 1990s, UK Gold offered Doctor Who an ever-valuable lifeline. By airing the programme so consistently for several years, those who had perhaps heard of the show or wanted to relive some classic adventures could now do so almost every single day. Whilst I may not be able to present viewing figures for these repeats, partly because there are so many of them and much of that data is unknown, I wanted to give UK Gold the credit it deserves, for without its dedication to Doctor Who during the wilderness years, it could be argued that the show may not have shone so brightly in the minds and hearts of the wider viewing public. So, with exciting new adventures in print, the return of a long-heralded classic to the archives, and a season of repeats which garnered respectable viewing figures, not to mention the now almost daily repeats going out on UK Gold, was all of this enough to convince the bigwigs of the BBC to bring back Doctor Who? Sadly, in 1992 at least, it wasn't to be. Though rumours continued to circulate that there were actually talks going on with other production companies, some even based in America, Steven Spielberg's name was even mentioned at one point. Would any of it come to fruition? Only time will tell. But first, there's a major celebration we have to account for. The year is 1993, and Doctor Who was celebrating its 30th anniversary. After the extravagant events that occurred during the 10th and 20th celebrations, fans were hopeful that this was going to be the year in which Doctor Who would make a triumphant return to television, or certainly to have it announced at the very least. No new series on TV was to materialise, but that didn't mean that plans weren't underway to try and celebrate this national institution in some form or another, and one avenue that kick-started the 30th anniversary celebrations was another series of repeat transmissions. After the somewhat successful run seen in the early months of 1992, which featured a story from Doctors 1, 2 and 3, a loose continuation was seemingly in order. To mark the fourth Doctor's era, Season 12's Genesis of the Daleks was chosen to represent Tom Baker's seven-year stint in the TARDIS. Having already been repeated as an omnibus in 1975, and as two 45-minute episodes in 1982, Genesis would now be repeated in its original six-part format for the first time since it debuted almost 18 years prior. Going out on BBC Two across six consecutive Fridays from the 8th of January to the 12th of February 1993, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 2.2 million viewers. A 0.3 decrease from the Demon showing, which had only concluded a few weeks beforehand. Now, obviously this is a far cry from the original transmission's 9.6 million average back in 1975, but every episode manages to stay above 2 million, though they never seem to crack the halfway point to 3 million. Chart-wise, however, for BBC Two programmes of their respective weeks, all episodes managed to stay within the top 30, aside from part 6, for which the chart data is not known. But as always, let's examine the potential reasons as to why the opener for the 1993 spring repeat season didn't perhaps gain a higher viewership as some would have expected. As mentioned, Genesis of the Daleks was and still is one of the most repeated Doctor Who serials on terrestrial television. The 9.6 million viewing average of the first broadcast dropped to 7.6 million for the omnibus that Christmas, and down further to 5 million for the 1982 airing, and now to just 2.2 million for 1993. So, after having multiple chances to already enjoy the classic adventure, some audiences could have perhaps simply passed and decided on watching something else. One factor that often gets overlooked too, is that by the time this repeat started, in early 1993, Genesis had been available to purchase on VHS for over a year having been bundled with the Sontaran experiment back in the October of 1991. So given that this was airing one episode a week, those who perhaps caught the opener simply couldn't wait that long, and perhaps went out to purchase the serial on video. After all, why wait six weeks to watch the complete adventure 
when you could just spend a tenner and watch it all in one go. There's two sides to every debate of course, but the point remains that the fact Genesis was available in full on VHS could have potentially damaged any terrestrial repeat chances of higher viewing figures. The usual factors for 90s retransmissions are also still in effect too. Doctor Who's gradual erosion in the wider public consciousness, airing on BBC Two instead of BBC One, and the ever-growing list of new channels providing viewing competition. Despite the lukewarm figures for Genesis, however, further repeats were scheduled to cover the Doctors of the 1980s, so we'll see shortly if they fared any better. With the 30th anniversary ploughing on, a lot of the focus across all media was to look back, to aptly celebrate the three decades worth of adventures that we've shared with the Doctor. However, for the Virgin New Adventures books, they continue to look to the future, delivering new stories featuring the 7th Doctor and friends on a now monthly basis. Fresh paperbacks that readers could enjoy throughout 1993 include The Highest Science, The Pit, Deceit, Lucifer Rising, White Darkness, Shadow Mind, Birthright, Iceberg, Blood Heat, The Dimension Riders, and The Left-Handed Hummingbird. Given these new stories were now coming out every month, it was clear that the VNAs had forged out their place within the Hooniverse. Whilst not every release received critical praise from fans, they were popular enough that they would continue to be published for several years to come. With Ace's character being substantially developed, and Bernice Summerfield was quickly becoming a fan favourite too, despite at this point having only appeared in print. Meanwhile, back on television, with the conclusion of Genesis of the Daleks, it was time for a fifth Doctor adventure to take to the airwaves. The story chosen was in fact his swan song, The Caves of Androzani, and considering that this is arguably one of, if not the best fifth Doctor story, it's hardly a surprising choice. Going out on BBC Two across four consecutive Fridays from the 19th of February to the 12th of March 1993, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 1.82 million viewers, a 0.38 drop from the previous serial. This marks the first terrestrial who repeat of the 1990s to fall below the 2 million mark, with all but part one falling below that threshold individually as well. Chart-wise, whilst we don't have data for parts two and four, one and three both finished at 27th inching towards falling out of the top 30 programs for BBC Two entirely. Did a similar set of factors that potentially damaged the Genesis repeat hit the Caves of Androzani one also? Well, in terms of a more convenient alternative being available, absolutely. The Caves of Androzani had been released to VHS in the January of 1992, being available to viewers for over a year by the time of its retransmission. And given that it was a single tape release, it was probably even cheaper to pick up than the Genesis double pack. In TV terms, whilst this marked the first repeat of Cave since its original airing back in 1984, you could potentially draw public association into the mix too. Tom Baker was arguably the most recognisable Doctor come the early 90s, given his long stint in the role, and with how many children of his era were also now adults, reminiscing about his adventures. Whilst today they have gained the appreciation they rightfully deserve, back in the 90s, the 80s Doctors weren't looked on as fondly. Many of these negative views stem from creative decisions rather than necessarily the actors themselves, but amongst the wider public, the 5th, 6th and 7th Doctor weren't exactly as popular as their 70s counterparts. So whilst it's purely speculation and theory, I'd argue that the general viewership may not have been as interested in the events in Androzani, particularly compared to the Tom Baker repeat, which had the Daleks to help further pique interest. However, there were two more repeats scheduled to go out in the spring of 1993, so we'll see shortly if they could raise the viewing figures back above the 2 million mark and continue to celebrate the changing faces of Doctor Who for its 30th birthday. On home video, the VHS range of Doctor Who would also bask in the celebratory spirit, with most 1993 releases showcasing a 30th anniversary banner underneath the Diamond logo. And quite appropriately, this would be the busiest year of the range yet, with new releases hitting shop shelves every single month. The 30th anniversary year releases included Terminus, Enlightenment, Image of the Fendal, The Demons, Terror of the Autons, Silver Nemesis, Vengeance on Varos, The Keeper of Traken, The Invasion, Doctor Who and the Silurians, The Curse of Peladon, Resurrection of the Daleks, The Two Doctors, Planet of Evil, and Dragonfire. These standard releases were accompanied by some special box sets, the first of their kind for Doctor Who on VHS. The Dalek tin included The Chase and Remembrance of the Daleks, and a special TARDIS-shaped tin contained all 14 episodes of The Trial of a Time Lord. With at least one story from each of the seven Doctors making its way to VHS in 1993, there truly was something for everyone. And with the 30th anniversary banner adorning most of their cases, it felt like the brand was in a triumphant and celebratory phase, despite the continued absence of new adventures on television. What was on television, however, was the run of classic repeats, the third of which focusing on the sixth Doctor's tenure and the story chosen being Revelation of the Daleks the concluding story from season 22.
Going out on BBC Two across four consecutive Fridays from the 19th of March to the 9th of April 1993, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 1.59 million viewers, a 0.23 decrease from the previous serial. This time around, not a single episode is able to surpass the 2 million mark, part 4 faring the worst with just 1.2 million, one of the lowest viewing figure scores to date. Chart position wise, fortunes were starting to slip also, with parts 1 and 3 just about holding on in the top 30, whilst the chart data for parts 2 and 4 is not known. But why was this happening? Why were the average viewing figures not remaining consistent or increasing as they had done during the 1992 run of repeats? I'd cite the public association with the 80s doctors and the program as a whole for being one potential factor in this lower viewership. With this era of the show not yet gaining much of the appreciation it has today, perhaps general audiences weren't as enthused to re-watch what, in my opinion, is one of the best classic Who adventures of all time. It was the four-part edit sold overseas that was retransmitted, as opposed to the original two 45-minute episodes. You could argue that some viewers, particularly fans, would have been frustrated that this chopped up version was being shown instead of the original edit, but that's purely speculation. Interestingly, Revelation wasn't available on VHS back in 1993, and would continue to evade the format until its eventual release alongside Planet of the Daleks in 1999 so you would have thought its unavailability on home video would have boosted its chances of higher viewing figures over the Tom Baker and Peter Davison repeats, but sadly it wasn't to be. Despite the dwindling viewership on these adventures, there was one serial left to air as part of the spring season, and the wider 30th anniversary celebrations. We'll see momentarily whether it could reverse the fortunes of the last few stories. But Doctor Who was a franchise not merely relegated to one kind of media. Aside from television, books and home video, one medium in which the Time Lord dabbled his hands in this year was radio. The Paradise of Death was a five-part audio drama, going out on BBC Radio 5 over five consecutive Fridays from the 27th of August to the 24th of September 1993. Starring John Pertwee as the Third Doctor, Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith, and Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier, the serial was generally well received. It wasn't Doctor Who's first foray into radio though, the 1985 serial Slipback takes that honour. But with a script penned by former producer Barry Letts, it felt right at home amongst the Third Doctor's era. Viewing or, or listening figures I should say, are generally unknown, but the serial performed well enough that this wouldn't be the last time this leading trio would be heard on the airwaves. The Paradise of Death would see a release on cassette in late 1993, be published as a last target novelisation in 1994, be issued on CD in 2000, with a subsequent release as part of a box set in 2011, and more recently is available to download digitally as well as getting a special release on vinyl as part of Record Store Day 2020, paired with the other 90s radio serial, The Ghost of Endspace, but more on that when we get there. We've come now to the last of the spring season repeats for 1993, and the story chosen to represent the Seventh Doctor's era was the opening serial for season 26, Battlefield. An odd choice to many, given that several other McCoy era serials already had cemented themselves as iconic classics, but this adventure did contain the Brigadier and Unit, so perhaps that could have been the primary reason? Going out on BBC Two across four consecutive Fridays from the 23rd of April to the 14th of May 1993, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 1.3 million viewers, a 0.29 drop from the previous serial. Heading closer and closer to falling below a million, it's a shame that instead of finishing on a high as the repeats did in 1992, the 1993 slate just went from a subdued bang to a tiny whimper. All four episodes once again failed to crack the 2 million mark, with parts 2 and 4 both recording the lowest point in viewership with just 1.2 million each. No chart data is available for this repeat, but to hazard a guess, I reckon these episodes would have been in the bottom ranks of the top 30, or have fallen further down the ladder. Do the factors we've looked at provide us with any clues into this continued drop in audience? Sylvester McCoy's era of the show, at least by 1993, was starting to gain appreciation for some of its later serials, such as The Curse of Fenric or Survival. Battlefield, ironically, is arguably the sole story from Season 26 that doesn't get the high praise of its peers from that same year. For many, it probably represents what they felt was wrong with late 80s Who. Some clunky dialogue, production values and special effects that weren't up to snuff with what was happening at the cinema, all that sort of stuff. Aside from being on BBC Two and facing hundreds of channels worth of competition, Battlefield, like Revelation of the Daleks, wasn't yet available to purchase on VHS, eventually getting a release on the format in 1998. So you'd have hoped more viewers would have tuned in to see the Doctor's final collaboration with the Brigadier, but it just didn't happen. Let's take a look now at the spring season of repeats of 1993 and see what we can deduce overall. By combining the average viewing figures from the four serials, 
we can calculate that the viewing average for this season of repeats stands at around roughly 1.7 million viewers, a 1 million drop from the average seen of the 1992 season. Some would argue this result was perhaps inevitable, with the novelty of Doctor Who being repeated wearing off quickly despite it being the 30th anniversary year. However, these numbers do mark a sad decline, from where Genesis starts with 2.2 million to where Battlefield ends at 1.3. However, similar to how The Demons was re-airing late in 1992, one serial would take to the airwaves towards the end of 1993, but more on that when we get there. For now, it's time to truly celebrate, with Doctor Who taking centre stage for its 30th anniversary special. The 30th anniversary special is Dimensions in Time. After capturing the first and second Doctors, the Rani sets out to trap the Doctors' remaining incarnations in the East End of London. There, the Doctors and their companions are pulled across the timelines, and are hounded by the Rani's menagerie of monsters. This story is comprised of two mini-episodes, which began airing on the 26th of November, 1993, and concluded the following day on the 27th. Here are the individual viewing figures for both episodes, and no, your eyes don't deceive you, they really are that high. Both episodes soar above 13 million viewers, a feat the program hadn't achieved since 1979. Despite the ever so slight drop between parts 1 and 2, it's clear that audiences wanted to see how the evil schemes of the Rani turned out. But I tell you what, regardless of what people may think of Dimensions in Time, it's such a good feeling to see Doctor Who do so well in the viewing figures tables again. When looking over at the weekly charts, it's another return to form. Part 1 manages 15th place, with Part 2 taking Doctor Who back into the top 10 for the first time in years, with a 10th place ranking. So what was it about Dimensions in Time that got millions upon millions glued to their screens? How did this all come to be? Well, you can't discuss Dimensions in Time without first discussing The Dark Dimension. It's a long tale with many twists and turns, one we'll go into in a bit more depth perhaps another time, but I'll summarise it as best I can. The idea of a brand new standalone adventure to help celebrate the 30th anniversary had been discussed the year before. Having worked at BBC Enterprises since the TV show had gone off the air, former producer John Nathan Turner, citing the strong video sales of classic serials, believed that a 90-minute direct-to-video special episode could be written and produced in time for the 30th anniversary itself in November of 1993. The story, which ended up being titled as Lost in the Dark Dimension, would see Tom Baker play a wizened old version of the Fourth Doctor, with the other surviving Doctors appearing in smaller cameo-esque appearances, something they understandably weren't too keen on. Appearances were planned from Daleks and Cybermen, and it was all to be helmed by Graham Harper, the director of some of the best Love 80s Who adventures. After numerous delays, swapping from being a direct-to-video project to being shown on BBC One, to funding setbacks and a whole host of other issues, the Dark Dimension project was ultimately cancelled in the summer months of 1993. With just months left until the big day itself, the mantle once again fell to John Nathan Turner to put something together to mark the occasion. The result was Dimensions in Time, a short two-part 13-minute adventure to be showcased as part of the BBC's annual Children in Need charity telethon. Doctor Who was no stranger to working with Pudsey Bear, Terry Wogan and co, with the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors, getting its UK premiere on the telethon ten years prior. With precious little time to film this new story, most of the allocated shooting time was performed on the set of the BBC's biggest soap opera EastEnders, for which several prominent characters would end up featuring in the special itself. To mark this historic Doctor Who EastEnders crossover, surely the publicity machine would work itself into an overdrive. That may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's fair to say that Dimensions in Time got a fair amount of hype leading up to its transmission. Promotion started in October, with a 3D week coming up for which Children in Need would be part of. Trailers started appearing featuring Sylvester McCoy appearing from the TARDIS into a viewer's living room, showcasing the funky 3D glasses you would have to wear for the new special. From early November, audiences could purchase the colourful specs for 99p, for which 25p of that purchase would go directly to Children in Need. Behind the scenes footage was showcased as part of a Pause for Pudsey broadcast on Sunday the 7th of November over on BBC One. Meanwhile, in the print world, Doctor Who was to receive an honour that hadn't been bestowed on it for a decade. To help promote Dimensions in Time, as well as highlighting the programme's 30th anniversary, Doctor Who would once again adorn the front cover of the Radio Times, its first time doing so since 1983. The weekly listings magazine was jam-packed with features regarding the upcoming special, as well as articles detailing the history of the programme. With audiences well and truly ready to experience this new 3D adventure with five different Doctors no less, the last bit of major promotion came the day before Part 1's broadcast. On Thursday the 25th of November, 7th Doctor Sylvester McCoy and former companion Deborah Watling appeared on BBC One's Good Morning to discuss the programme and promote the forthcoming special. With the stage well and truly set, 
Dimensions in Time was introduced in a unique segment set within the world of Noel's House Party, one of the BBC's biggest Saturday night programmes of the era, hosted by the ever-popular Noel Edmonds. With the TARDIS arriving in Crinkly Bottom, John Pertwee emerges to ridicule Noel for a little bit, before the pair and the studio audience don their 3D glasses as the adventure begins. The story itself is… well… god, how do I summarise Dimensions in Time? I've already done a more in-depth look at this special as part of my Weird Who series, so if you'd like to learn more about the wackiness within, then definitely check that video out. Back here though, given that the viewing figures for Dimensions in Time were so high, was the competition over on ITV just so lacklustre that it didn't stand a chance against the combined might of five Doctors, and two severed heads if you want to be technical? Well, for the seven and a half minutes that part one was on the air, its immediate competition on the other side was the TV movie, Voyage of Terror, the Akio Loro Affair which, bless its heart, seemingly has been consigned largely to TV history, bowing to the might of Dimensions in Time, but I digress. To be fair, Dimensions pulled in around 4 million more viewers than the previous 20 minute segment in The Children in Eat Telethon, so if an extra 4 million tuned in just for a few minutes of Doctor Who, I think that tells you something about the dedication of the viewership. Part 2 went out as part of that Saturday's Knowles House Party, creating a fitting continuity, as Mr Edmonds was able to help introduce both installments. ITV that day was screening the romantically themed game show Blind Date, which had been on air since 1985 and was hosted by former 60s pop star Scylla Black. Despite being nearly a decade old, the programme was still incredibly popular, pulling roughly around 10 million viewers at this time. So for a short five and a half minute Doctor Who segment to eclipse this light entertainment juggernaut by a good few million is quite the feat, and one I'd argue shouldn't be brushed aside. In the 30 years since its original broadcast, it's fair to say that Dimensions in Time is a rather divisive story in the realm of fan opinion. Whilst many will ridicule it for its rather rushed nature, lack of an in-depth plot, complaints that certain doctors or companions don't get adequate time in the spotlight, etc etc, but regardless of all that, one point I would argue in Dimensions in Time's favour is that it has fun in absolute abundance. It's a breezy adventure, but one filled with many moments that certainly made me smile. It's great to see tons of the old companions pop up here and there, and that extends to the surviving Doctors as well, and if you lean into the inherent madness of it all, it's a rip-roaring good time. Given that it was made for charity, the likelihood of Dimensions in Time being released on home media is highly unlikely. Some would argue that's probably for the best, but I live in hope that one day, Dimensions in Time will get a lot more love than it has done over the past three decades. Oh, and of course, it's canon. So now your other selves are all free. Certainly I, I mean we, are difficult to get rid of. <laughs> Dimensions in Time may not have been what viewers had hoped for, in terms of a 30th anniversary special, however, in the weeks leading up to, and immediately after its transmission, one story had been chosen to showcase Doctor Who on its original home, BBC One. This was quite the move, as this would mark the first time the Time Lord would appear on the channel since his last new adventure back in 1989. Perhaps if the viewing figures proved to be strong enough, the BBC would finally be convinced? But hang on, out of nearly 150 adventures, which one would be chosen to represent the programme as a whole? The answer would be Season 10's Planet of the Daleks, from 1973, a serial featuring one of the most popular Doctors alongside their most deadly adversary. Going out for the first time in 20 years, that's bound to drum up at least some attention. Going out on BBC One over six Fridays from the 5th of November to the 17th of December 1993, here are the viewing figures for this repeat which averaged out at 3.6 million viewers, a massive 2.3 million increase from Battlefield's repeat average just months earlier. All six episodes sit comfortably within the 3 million range, with episode 2 managing to just crack 4 million. Unfortunately, chart data isn't available for this transmission, but given this is BBC One, the flagship channel of the corporation, these numbers I would argue imply that Doctor Who would have been some way off placing within the top 40. However, one thing is for certain, the show got an incredible boost with this transmission, so what helped it achieve that? The most obvious factor would arguably be that Planet of the Daleks was being shown on BBC One as opposed to BBC Two. The flagship channel also tended to garner far more viewership than its younger brother, but could those numbers perhaps be even higher? I'd argue yes, if it wasn't for the immediate competition on the channel's biggest rival, ITV. As these episodes were going out at 7.30pm, this placed them directly opposite the other side's biggest programme, Coronation Street. The cast of The Cobbles had been an unbeatable rival to Doctor Who in its final few years of the late 80s, and whilst this repeat performed admirably, especially given its age, Corrie was gaining three if not four times the amount of viewership, so from the get-go, you probably wouldn't have been blamed for thinking this repeat didn't stand much of a chance ratings-wise. A factor that I think also helped was that the adventure wasn't available to buy on VHS, 
releasing several years later in 1999. Furthermore, given that this was to tie in with the 30th anniversary, the six episodes were aired under the banner of Doctor Who and the Daleks, with special mini-documentaries preceding each episode. One in particular, Missing in Action, is notable for explaining the story of the many lost episodes of Doctor Who, as well as explaining why that week's episode, Part 3, was only available in black and white. The first three episodes were aired over consecutive Fridays in November, taking a one-week break due to the Children in Need telethon that year, and of course Dimensions in Time lest we forget. But if this repeat airing of Planet of the Daleks proved anything, it was that Doctor Who, against the toughest ITV competition, not to mention the various satellite channels, still had a firm audience on BBC One. For a 20-year-old serial to air at a primetime evening slot on a Friday and achieve nearly a 4 million viewing average, that alone showcases that the franchise still had so much to offer, especially if new adventures were to be commissioned. But despite the phenomenal numbers of Dimensions in Time and the decent figures for the Planet of the Daleks repeat, as 1993 was drawing to a close, there was still no word of a new series entering production. However, just two days after the conclusion of Dimensions in Time, on Monday the 29th of November, 1993, a special documentary was set to air on BBC One, to help conclude the 30th anniversary celebrations for Doctor Who. 30 Years in the TARDIS was at the time the ultimate love letter to the programme. Featuring interviews with former cast, crew and production members, brand new linking material featuring said people, as well as a wealth of archive clips from all eras of the show's history. I would love to show you what the viewing figures were for this documentary, but unfortunately, despite extensive research, I just can't seem to trace them. Given that it aired at 8pm, a nice evening slot, I would have hoped it would have achieved at least 3 million viewers, particularly after the big promotional boost via Dimensions in Time and the semi-successful repeat of Planet of the Daleks, which was between its third and fourth episode when 30 years went to air. Sure, these days it's been superseded by further documentaries, but at the time, it was certainly seen as the definitive documentary on Doctor Who. An extended cut was released to VHS in 1994, and that same extended cut appeared on DVD in 2013, bundled together with Sharda as part of the Legacy Collection box set. But as 1993 wound off, the big dream had yet to come to fruition. Despite all the celebratory efforts, all the new books, videos, the ever-faithful Doctor Who magazine, the spring season of repeats, the BBC One Planet repeat, and the critically panned but numerically successful Dimensions in Time, it seemed that nothing was swaying the BBC or any other production company into bringing Doctor Who back for the 1990s. Alan Yentob, then controller of BBC One, teased fans a little at the end of 30 years in the TARDIS, giving renewed hope that perhaps soon, the blue box would show up on viewer screens again. But after four years of waiting, the chances of that actually happening seem to grow fainter by the year. The year is now 1994, the 30th anniversary is well and truly over, and Doctor Who fans once again began to play the waiting game, wondering whether this could be the year in which the Time Lord would make their triumphant return to television. But as we've seen so far in these wilderness years, there wasn't exactly a lack of Who content that would allow them to keep busy during the meantime, and for the third year running, said content would be led by a series of repeats. After a strong start in 1992, and a less viewed but semi-successful year in 1993, 1994 would begin again with a run of classic Doctor Who adventures over on BBC Two. The story chosen this time was the season 10 finale, The Green Death, featuring John Pertwee as the third Doctor, the departure of Katie Manning as Joe Grant, and the fiendish Killer Maggots, a resultant of our misuse of the environment. Going out on BBC Two across six consecutive Sundays from the 2nd of January to the 6th of February 1994, here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 1.2 million viewers, a colossal 2.4 million drop from the previous serial, which had only concluded a little over two weeks ago over on BBC One. No episode manages to break 2 million, with episode 3 arguably showing one of the worst individual results in Doctor Who history, with just 0.8 million, or 800,000 viewers. Whilst no chart data exists for this repeat, it's probably for the best, as I could arguably guess that no episode cracked the top 30, or even top 40 or 50. So what happened here? The Green Death was and is revered as being one of the best stories of the 70s and of the show period, so why weren't people tuning in for the serial's first repeat since Christmas of 1973? One notable change in this season of repeats is the day and time in which the episodes would go out. 1992 and 1993 saw repeat screenings go out on Friday evenings, generally considered to be a pretty decent time slot for any channel. However, beginning in 1994, Doctor Who was now airing on Sunday afternoons, with all six episodes of The Green Death starting at noon. 
Daytime television viewing is generally lower, across all channels, and has been this way for decades. Even at the weekends, some audience members will undoubtedly be working, and those that aren't are probably doing some other activity to fill out their weekend, as opposed to watching television, a tradition typically reserved for the evening by millions of households. So, with the new daytime slot, you could argue that Doctor Who had shot itself in the foot before it had even left the gate. Whilst I'd argue the shift in the day and time slot is the prime reason for the Green Death's lacklustre result, perhaps a case of burnout had also occurred amongst the general viewing public. Franchise burnout happens a lot more commonly these days, with properties such as Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but after lots of exposure in various forms of media throughout 1993, more casual audience members could have perhaps grown a little tired of Doctor Who. However, speculation aside, this was not the way in which the 1994 repeat season hoped to start off, and unfortunately, the viewing figures yielded would bring about severe consequences, the first of which was the cancellation of a VHS release for The Green Death. Originally planned for shortly after the repeat sometime in 1994, the six-part serial wouldn't see a release on home video until 1996. Second and perhaps more damning, will come to shortly. Meanwhile, in the world of print, The Virgin New Adventures continued to pump out one new book every month of the year, 1994 being the first year in which this happened. The 12 new books featuring the 7th Doctor, Ace and Bernice Summerfield were Conundrum, No Future, Tragedy Day, Legacy, Theatre of War, All Consuming Fire, Blood Harvest, Strange England, First Frontier, St. Anthony's Fire, Falls the Shadow, and Parasite. The more mature novels continued to be eagerly read by fans of the show, with some gaining high praise whilst others gaining critical derision. But whilst the VNAs were welcome for providing new stories for the incumbent characters, a brand new book ranged from Virgin focused on the first six Doctors. The Missing Adventures, as they were dubbed, told new stories for these past Time Lords, adapting the more fleshed out and mature detail that the VNAs had become known for. Five books in the Missing Adventures range made their debut in 1994, these being Goth Opera, Evolution, Venusian Lullaby, The Crystal Bucephalus, and State of Change. So, now with not one but two successful booklines under its belt, Virgin was now able to draw from the vast palette of Doctor Who completely, and provide young and upcoming writers with the chance to showcase their talents and ideas. Back in the landscape of TV, despite the poor performance of The Green Death, a second serial had been selected to be repeated. The choice this time was season 13's Pyramids of Mars, one of the most highly praised and beloved stories from the Tom Baker era, and again from the show as a whole. Going out on BBC Two over four consecutive Sundays from the 6th to the 27th of March 1994, here are the individual viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at just 1 million viewers, a 0.2 decrease from the previous serial. It's a sad state to see, not helped when you notice that part three can't even muster above 1 million, and the other three parts only just manage. Once again, no chart data is available, but given these numbers, that's probably for the best. Did similar factors that hit the Green Death also affect this renowned adventure? Well, it certainly was a bizarre choice to repeat, certainly by 1994. Pyramids of Mars had been available to buy on VHS for almost 10 years, first releasing as an omnibus edition back in 1985, later gaining a reissue in that form in 1987, before being released in its original episodic form in February of 1994, around the same time this repeat started transmitting. So tell me, what do you think the general public would rather do? Make time during Sunday lunch to watch the serial over four weeks, or just pop down to Woolworths and pay a tenner for the complete story on one VHS tape. I understand doing tie-ins, but surely you'd wait until after the repeat concludes before releasing the episodic version to home video? Once again, the day and time slot pyramids went out in arguably did it no favours, likewise with all the competition that ran across the airwaves. Sadly, this would mark the last terrestrial repeat of a Doctor Who adventure for over five years. With the poor results seen by these two serials, no further repeats were scheduled, leaving viewers with only what was available on VHS, or the constant repeats on UK Gold, provided that they had the appropriate satellite TV setup. With an average viewership of just 1.1 million across the two stories, it's hardly surprising more repeats didn't follow for the 1994 season. No further attempts were made in 1995, or for most of the 90s in general. It wouldn't be until late 1999 when Doctor Who would see itself repeated on terrestrial airwaves, but more on that when we get there. It's a shame they ended here with such low viewing figures, especially in the case of Pyramids of Mars. For a story that gained almost 14 million viewers when it was shown at Christmas 1975, to sink to just a fraction of that almost 20 years later is really heartbreaking to say the least. But whilst you couldn't get your fix on the BBC, you could certainly indulge yourself in the ever-expanding library of VHS releases. After the anniversary year that was 1993, 
The VHS range continued to steadily release more classic stories to the format, alongside some special releases too. Whilst not putting out as many tapes as they did in 1993, BBC Video would issue the following. Arc of Infinity, Inferno, Ghostlight, The Visitation paired together with Black Orchid, Destiny of the Daleks, The Seeds of Doom, The Rescue paired together with The Romans, Kinder, and Snake Dance. These titles were getting their first release on VHS, however there were more tapes that came out in 1994 that were re-releases of past titles. These included The Ark in Space, Day of the Daleks, and Pyramids of Mars. All three had seen home video releases in the 1980s, however these showcased the adventures in a truncated, omnibus format. Now they could be viewed complete and unedited, as the cover sticker brightly proclaims. 1994 also saw the last releases in the Year series, this title focusing on Sixth Doctor Colin Baker, the actor himself providing new links between archive clips. For whatever reason, tapes dedicated to Peter Davison and Sylvester McCoy's tenures on the programme were neither produced nor released. The last VHS of 1994 to cover is more than 30 years in the TARDIS. The original broadcast of the documentary back in 1993 was 50 minutes in length. This tape proved to be something of a definitive edition, as the runtime was extended to 90 minutes and contained tons of new scenes and clips. So whilst not boasting as many releases as 1993, the VHS slate for Doctor Who in 1994 continued to be consistent, and varied in terms of what it offered to consumers. And so 1994 ran its course, another year in which a wealth of Doctor Who content was available in one form or another, yet a new television series remained less of a rampant want and more like a distant dream. Unbeknownst to many at the time, work was beginning to take place behind the scenes, in an attempt to truly resurrect the programme for a new generation, but more on that when we get there. The year is now 1995, and the year started off with a notable absence of Doctor Who on terrestrial television. The last three years of classic repeats was not embarking on a fourth run, instead leaving it to the VHS range and the satellite repeats on UK Gold to help scratch that itch for viewers. But with no repeat broadcast scheduled to air on terrestrial television, Virgin Books perhaps more than ever now bore the responsibility of continuing to publish brand new Doctor Who media for eager fans. In their fifth year of new adventures, 12 more books featuring the 7th Doctor were published. The titles in question were Warlock, Set Piece, Infinite Requiem, Sanctuary, Human Nature, Original Sin, Sky Pirates, Zampa, Toy Soldiers, Head Games, The Also People, and Shakedown. 1995 proved to be quite the notable year for the range in terms of companions. Ace would bow out in February's release Set Piece, whilst the Doctor and Benny would be joined by two new companions, Chris and Roz, in Original Sin, which came out in June. The most notable adventure of the year was arguably Human Nature, written by Paul Cornell. By this point, Cornell was well respected amongst the Who fandom, often cited as being one of the best writers across the entire range. This story in particular would be adapted for the modern series of Doctor Who, appearing together with the Family of Blood during Series 3 in 2007, again written by Paul Cornell. The Missing Adventures line blossomed in its second year, following the New Adventures example of publishing a brand new book every month of the year. The 12 releases featuring past Doctors included The Romance of Crime, The Ghosts of Endspace, Time of Your Life, Dancing the Code, The Menagerie, System Shock, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Invasion of the Cat People, Menagra, Millennial Rights, The Empire of Glass, and Lords of the Storm. With all seven Doctors receiving regular new stories, fans were certainly given a wide variety in terms of the adventures they could indulge in, not to mention the continued releases of classic TV serials on VHS. If you thought the VHS range was slowing down after the mammoth 30th anniversary slate, then their release for 1995 was here to prove you dead wrong. A whopping 21 releases came out across the year, the standard tapes being The Android Invasion, Carnival of Monsters, The Mark of the Rani, Time and the Rani, Frontier in Space, The Sea Devils, Warriors of the Deep, Paradise Towers, Survival, and The Monster of Peladon. Once again, three stories got a re-release, presented in episodic form for the first time compared to their omnibus releases back in the 1980s. These were Spearhead from Space, Death to the Daleks, and The Robots of Death. The one-off pilot, K9 and Company, got a VHS release this year, as did the six stories that made up Season 16, the key to time season. Released in pairs between April and June, the six serials were notable for their case spines forming a rather colourful and appealing image. However, arguably the most exciting release of 1995 would be the twin release of The King's Demons, together with the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors. Now, the latter had been released a few times before, as a slightly edited release in 1985, and its original unedited form in 1990. However, this new version was notable for being dubbed the Special Edition, with new material, new effects and new music, 
this was the first time a Classic Who adventure had been repackaged and released in this way, and similar to what we saw with the presentation of Sharda, it certainly wouldn't be the last time Doctor Who stories would receive this treatment. So, with their busiest year so far in terms of releases, BBC Video's Doctor Who range showed no signs of slowing down anytime soon. Particularly impressive, given that new adventures hadn't been seen on TV for more than half a decade by this point. One avenue I'll briefly touch upon is the release of new live-action adventures, created by fans. Whilst none of them strictly acquired the Doctor Who license from the BBC, several fans had begun forming their own production companies and releasing content featuring actors associated with the programme. Real Time Pictures was one such company, created by Keith Barnfather in 1984. Having been one of the founding members of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society during the 1970s, Barnfather had amassed a wide range of Who-related contacts over the years, which helped form the basis of perhaps Real Time's most notable series, Mythmakers. A series of interview-based programmes often hosted by Nicholas Briggs, an up-and-coming actor who would later voice the Daleks for the revival of the Doctor in the 21st century. However, one interesting piece of Real Time's output was the 1995 drama Downtime. Having licensed certain elements from Doctor Who, this adventure saw Nicholas Courtney, Deborah Watling and Elizabeth Sladen return to their roles of the Brigadier, Victoria Waterfield and Sarah Jane Smith respectively. Being a sequel to the Yeti stories of the 1960s, it serves to expand these characters further, including their connections to one another, as well as introduce new ones, such as Kate Lethbridge-Stewart, the Brigadier's daughter. Played here by Beverly Cressman, this character would eventually see a huge revival in the 2010s, appearing in the main programme, now played by Gemma Redgrave. So, whilst not widely talked about today, fan productions such as these equally help play their role in sustaining the memory of Doctor Who, whilst providing fans with new stories to sink their teeth into, whilst waiting for the eventual return of the television show. However, as 1995 was nearing its end, once more, no such new TV series emerged, or was even scarcely talked about. What was talked about was an upcoming TV movie, one starring Paul McGann as the brand new 8th Doctor, and would be debuting in May of 1996. Whilst coming out of nowhere for some, the wheels had been turning on this project for quite a while. The year is 1996, and after long last, Doctor Who fans across the world finally had their patience pay off. For the first time since Survival back in 1989, Doctor Who would be returning to TV with a brand new feature-length episode that wouldn't be a reboot, as had been rumoured for some time, but a continuation of where the show left off. Sylvester McCoy would appear in the film, closing out the long life of the Seventh Doctor, and to take his place would be 37-year-old Paul McGann, stepping into the shoes of the brand new Eighth Doctor. But hang on, how did all of this come about? After years of silence, how did a TV movie materialise onto viewers' screens? Well, we'll delve into that a bit more when we get there, but first, there was another new adventure to kickstart the year, featuring the oldest surviving Doctor of the day. The second Doctor Who radio drama of the 90s was The Ghosts of Endspace, written by former producer Barry Letts and once again starring John Pertwee as the Third Doctor, Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith and Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier. Broadcast on BBC Radio 2 as six 30-minute episodes from the 20th of January to the 24th of February 1996. Like with the previous radio serial, The Paradise of Death, viewing or listening figures are unavailable. However, this radio play was a long time coming. It had originally been recorded back in 1994, and the novelisation had followed in 1995 as part of the Missing Adventures range. If you wish to hear this adventure for yourself, a cassette was released back in 1996 with a CD variant following in 2000. This was then reissued as part of a box set in 2011, but if physical media isn't your thing, it is available to download as an audiobook. And for the Ultimate Collector, The Ghosts of End Space is available to listen to on vinyl, paired together with The Paradise of Death as a special box set, released for Record Store Day 2020. The concept of further radio plays starring the trio of the Third Doctor, Sarah Jane and the Brigadier was discussed, however, these would ultimately not come to fruition. For just a few months after the Ghost of End Space concluded, John Pertwee passed away. The news shocked the fandom and the general public, with the iconic actor not only being most remembered as the Doctor, but perhaps even more so for Wurzel Gummidge, the friendly scarecrow who had won the hearts of millions. Both Doctor Who and Wurzel were parts that John held close to his heart all the way up until his passing, and in accordance with his will, a toy of Wurzel Gummidge was affixed to his coffin. At a time when the fandom had renewed life to it, with high excitement and anticipation for the upcoming TV movie, to lose such a monumental figure was such a devastating blow. When the film was broadcast in the UK, just one week later, it was dedicated to his memory. John was survived by his wife Ingeborg and his two children, Sean and Dariel. He was 76 years old. 
As anticipation for the return of Doctor Who to television grew, the expanded media that had helped sustain the show was continuing on as normal. The Virgin New Adventures, which had been producing original novels since 1991, continued to showcase new adventures for the Seventh Doctor and his various companions. Like the past few years, a new title was released every single month, and the books that hit shelves up until the TV movies broadcast were Just War, War Child, Sleepy, Death and Diplomacy, and Happy Endings, which was the 50th title in the Virgin New Adventures range. Depicting the wedding of Bernice Summerfield, a companion born in this particular era, the novel served as a pseudo-celebration of everything that the range had achieved. The other Virgin Doctor Who range, The Missing Adventures, was keeping up a consistent release schedule also, with one new title appearing on bookshop shelves every month throughout 1996. The Missing Adventures released up to the TV movie's broadcast are Downtime, The Man in the Velvet Mask, The English Way of Death, The Eye of the Giant, and The Sands of Time. As The Missing Adventures focused on the first six Doctors, and given that the VNAs were solely dedicated to continuing the adventures of the seventh Doctor, there was some speculation as to whether the range would continue with the upcoming eighth Doctor, or if it had come to a natural end. We'll view the answer to that in a little while, for the main event of the year was about to arrive. The return of Doctor Who came in the form of the TV movie. In a bid to steal the Doctor's remaining lives, the Master causes the TARDIS to be diverted to Earth at the turn of the century. There, following his regeneration, the Doctor joins forces with Grace Holloway to thwart the Master's plan and save the world. This story is comprised of one 85-minute episode, which first premiered in the United States on the 14th of May, 1996, and later on BBC One on the 27th of May. Here are the viewing figures for the TV movie, clocking in an impressive 9.08 million. This marked the first time that Doctor Who had scored over 9 million viewers since 1982, and for the many fans nervous at how the film would perform ratings-wise, you'd hope with a result like this, they could let out a sigh of relief. When looking at the chart positions, the TV movie peaked at 15th place, the first time that Doctor Who had entered the top 20 in an excruciatingly long time. Well, that's if you discount Dimensions in Time, which of course you shouldn't because, as we all know, it's canon. So after a seven-year hitch, we have The Doctor's return bringing over 9 million viewers and being amongst the top 20 programs of the week, but could it have performed even better? Well, as always, the two factors we immediately should consider are competition and promotion. By 1996, there were now several hundred potential channels that could steal audience away from Doctor Who, but for consistency, we're going to focus on the BBC's oldest rival, ITV. The other side was airing the popular game show Take Your Pick, before an episode of period drama Bramwell which also performed well in the ratings. Doctor Who's return was able to trounce them both, with Bramwell in particular suffering a ratings drop in the millions. So being able to fend off immediate competition certainly played into the TV movie's 9 million viewers, but what about promotion? Given that this was Doctor Who's return to the television stage after seven years, a good bout of it was undoubtedly needed. For fans, they could get monthly coverage and updates in the form of the ever-popular Doctor Who magazine. Having been on the shop shelves since 1979, DWM led the charge regarding excitement for the upcoming project. For the general public, shortly after filming wrapped in February 1996, various articles in different newspapers began to spring up, featuring interviews with cast and crew. On television, various creatives associated with the show began to spring up on talk shows, such as John Pertwee, Roberta Tovey and Gary Gillett from DWM appearing on ITV's This Morning. Whilst they were mainly promoting a widescreen VHS release of Doctor Who and the Daleks, discussion of the new TV movie popped up also. Back in the print world, March saw Doctor Who once again take the front cover of the Radio Times, albeit shared with the insanely popular X-Files. Interviews became increasingly common both in print and on television, with Paul McGann doing lots of them over in America, and Philip Siegel, the man largely responsible for getting Doctor Who back on the air, also took part in interviews extensively. We'll touch more on him a little bit later. Online interviews were becoming more prevalent around this time too, given the expansion and accessible nature of the internet, which was still in its earliest phases in terms of its adoption and exposure to the general public. The TV movie was set to air on the Fox network over in the States on the 14th of May, being the Tuesday night movie of that particular week. Fox did push Doctor Who, including an electronic press kit, numerous advertisements in print and trailers on television, promising the film would be the event of the year, amongst other things. Back home in the UK, Doctor Who's promotional train continued at full steam ahead. The Radio Times awarded Doctor Who the front cover on its week of transmission, no share in this time around. Not only did the new project receive this lavish front cover, but the listings magazine also came with a supplement souvenir piece, a 16-page mini-mag entitled Return of the Time Lord. Aside from articles about the movie, 
it was nominated as one of that week's TV choices. A couple of weeks earlier, around the time of the American broadcast, the TV movie would have two premiere screenings at BAFTA down in London, one for the press and one for a select group of fans, who had won tickets via a BBC competition. Set reports and teasers continued to come regularly, and two days before transmission, the Sci-Fi Channel would showcase a 20-minute making-of documentary. This largely utilised interviews that Fox conducted for their electronic press kit, but it also included reactions and thoughts from those who had attended the BAFTA screenings. I think it's fair to say that Doctor Who's return had indeed been well promoted, and I didn't even touch on everything that there was. One interesting factor to note, though, is the time slot in which it went out here in the UK. Starting at 8.30pm and running until 9.55, this was one of the latest transmission slots that Doctor Who would ever occupy. The 27th of May was a bank holiday Monday, a warm one at that, but younger audiences perhaps may not have been allowed to stay up so late to watch. Keep in mind, by 1996, VCRs had become a household staple, being largely more affordable than they'd ever been 10 years previously. So for anyone who was out or wanted to watch something else, or if they weren't allowed to watch given the time slot, they could simply whack a VHS tape into the recorder and watch it at another time. In the mid-90s, ratings were still collated from a live or overnight broadcast, whereas today other factors such as 7 days or even 28 days are considered into the final figure, that wasn't the case back in 1996. Had Doctor Who started at, say, around 7pm, it could have arguably received an even higher viewership than it came out with. But regardless, 9 million viewers was still an impressive figure in 1996 TV ratings, but for the BBC, this apparently wasn't enough. High-level members of the corporation had been expecting around 12 million to tune in, which arguably even for Doctor Who is a little excessive given the circumstances. Nevertheless, falling 3 million short of that ambition was viewed by certain corners of the Beeb as a disappointment. But how did this all come to be in the first place? Paul McGann's 8th Doctor didn't just appear out of nowhere. A great deal of planning, frustrating business deals, and a whole manner of external factors contributed to this film being made. And it can all be traced right back to around the time of the programme originally coming off the air in 1989. And with one man whose passion for the show he'd loved as a child, resulted in Doctor Who being resurrected for the 1990s. Philip Siegel was a programming executive based out in the United States. As a boy growing up in England, he had watched Doctor Who from the very beginning, falling in love with its characters and storytelling. Now a programming executive for Columbia Pictures, in 1989 he reached out to the BBC, suggesting a possible co-production between the two parties that could invigorate and revitalise Doctor Who for the approaching 1990s. However, this was just around the time that the show had its cancellation confirmed, so the BBC weren't particularly interested, as several areas of the corporation had come to loathe and despise Doctor Who believing it was long past its prime, and due to come to an end rather than be invested in. Undeterred, Siegel would continue to seek some sort of co-production deal with the BBC, made somewhat easier after the passing of the Broadcasting Act of 1990. This motion deemed that the BBC would now have to source 25% of its programming to independent companies, and Doctor Who could easily fall into that bracket. However, around this time, the possibility of a Doctor Who film was on the cards. This had been talked about for the majority of the Sylvester McCoy era, with British company Coast to Coast picking up the film rights, though details on the production had long been in limbo. Prioritising this film over a TV series, the BBC remained reluctant to commit to a co-production deal. It's important to note that the drama side of the BBC and its commercial arm, BBC Enterprises, were vastly different companies with different ideas and very little communication between them. Enterprises essentially cherished Doctor Who, recognising the money the brand made, very little of which would go back into the drama department. Internal politics aside, Philip Siegel was changing hands, moving from Columbia to Amblin Entertainment, the production company owned by Steven Spielberg, one of the most famous and renowned film directors in the world. Spielberg himself was interested in Doctor Who, more so after Siegel had conversations with him detailing the vast world that the programme had built for itself. With one of the most well-known film directors displaying interest, the BBC started to sit up and take notice. However, they were still favouring the proposed film, which at this point was still going nowhere. Philip had found out that the company's holding on the film rights was coming to an end, but if they shot some second unit footage, which they planned to do with Star Trek legend Leonard Nimoy, then their holding on the film rights would be extended. Determined not to let this happen, as it was a mere stalling tactic, Philip phoned up Nimoy and laid out the situation, to which the actor unsurprisingly got cold feet and never took part in the film. With one stalled project out of the way, Philip quickly had to contend with another, this time coming from BBC Enterprises. As mentioned in the previous instalment, to try and capitalise on Doctor Who's 30th anniversary in 1993, Enterprises wanted to commission a brand new straight-to-video film entitled Lost in the Dark Dimension. 
However, from the get-go, there was a litany of problems, and when asked if he'd be happy with the film going ahead, Philip asked his contacts at Enterprises to send him the script. Upon receiving it, he immensely disliked what he read, and believing that this would severely harm his own attempts at relaunching the show, he asked that the film be put on hold. This, combined with financial problems amongst other things, ultimately saw an end to the Dark Dimension project. But we did get Dimensions in time as a replacement, so we're the real winners here. Towards the end of 1993, Philip Siegel was introduced to the new face in charge of BBC One, Alan Yentob. The new controller was nowhere near as dismissive of Doctor Who as his predecessors and peers, and always maintained that the door to the program's return was never closed. After initial meetings, Yentob commissioned Siegel to develop a series bible, which was duly written by John Leakley. Leakley became fascinated with the world of Gallifrey, especially the inner Time Lord politics and the Doctor's motivations for running away. When Yentob received the bible, it was written from the perspective of a Cardinal Barusa, detailing the adventures of his grandson, the Doctor, who was looking for his lost father, Gallifreyan explorer Ulysses. Whilst Yentob delved through this bible, discussions of casting for the Doctor were underway. Early favourites for Siegel included Michael Crawford and Michael Palin, both of whom politely declined. Several high-profile names were bandied about, but eventually one name that was considered was Paul McGann. Having seen him in the 1987 film With Nail and I, Siegel became fascinated with the Scouse actor, seeing him for an audition tape from which McGann would read from the first draft script, written by Leakley. Speaking of scripts, in the September of 1994, the first draft of the opening episode was delivered and was universally panned by practically anyone who read it. Its tone was compared to the Indiana Jones series, which Steven Spielberg had directed and he felt he'd already made his mark on that kind of story. He officially requested that his name, as well as Amblin, be taken off the project. A crushing blow for Siegel, who knew the industry might of the two could have really benefited the project. There was a silver lining, however. Trevor Walton, who ran the TV movie department over at the Fox Network, got in touch with Siegel, wanting to make a single film of Doctor Who with him. Whilst this was positive, Siegel knew both the BBC and Universal, who were set to be the US distributors, didn't want a single film, they wanted a series. The way around this was to frame the upcoming project as a backdoor TV pilot, that if it did well, a series would follow. Eventually, British writer Matthew Jacobs was brought in. The focus on Gallifrey and the Doctor's father was abandoned, and a setting more akin to a typical Who adventure was included instead. What was also now included was the Seventh Doctor, to be played once again by Sylvester McCoy, establishing a direct continuity with the classic series. This move, however, worried the BBC, who having viewed McCoy's tenure as the least successful period in the show's history, believed that including him in the new project wouldn't be accessible to new viewers and would hamper the film's success as a whole. Philip Siegel remained firm on this, however, wanting to honour and respect what came before, and so Sylvester would stay. With Geoffrey Sachs locked in as the director, and principal cast members such as Daphne Ashbrook and Yi Ji Zhou booked in, everything was set for filming to begin in the first few months of 1996. Regarding casting, whilst Paul McGann was well known here in the UK, that wasn't so much the case in the States. Fox continuously voiced their concern of the lead star, and as a compromise, demanded that the master be played by a known American actor, leading to Eric Roberts bagging the part of the Doctor's arch nemesis. After various issues plagued the production during its shooting, by the spring, all was ready for the TV movie to make its splash in May. Now, I've summarised how it all came to be in a very quick and roundabout way, and if you wish to learn more about this in greater detail, I highly recommend The Seven Year Hitch, a documentary you can find on the two-disc DVD or Blu-ray of the movie. But another important factor we haven't yet discussed are the American viewing figures. We haven't delved into US ratings before, but for this particular Doctor Who episode, it's crucial. Given that this was a co-production largely funded by Fox and other American investors, the TV movie needed to perform strongly enough for the broadcasters to even consider taking it up as an ongoing series. As mentioned, extensive promotion was done with the budget available, but when it all boiled down to the premiere night on Tuesday the 14th of May, how did it compare? The TV movie on its American broadcast pulled in around 8.3 million viewers. Whilst this is lower than the UK transmission, at first glance you could claim that this is still a respectable figure. In the UK, absolutely. In the US, not as much. First off, the population size of the two countries is vastly different. In 1996, there were roughly around 58 million people living in the UK, compared to the roughly 270 million in the US, an almost five-fold gap. Furthermore, Philip Siegel was well aware that Fox would want Doctor Who to gain a 15% audience share at the least for discussions of a series to take place. It would eventually only gain a 9% share, but its competition made a large impact on its prospective success. 
On the ABC network, they were screening an episode of Roseanne, entitled Heart and Soul, which was the penultimate episode of the show's eighth season. Given that this was resolving a dramatic cliffhanger, in which Roseanne's husband Dan suffered a heart attack, interest was high, and ultimately, 21 million viewers tuned in, more than double the amount who were watching Doctor Who. The popular sitcom Home Improvement also aired whilst Doctor Who was premiering, and attracted an audience of nearly 23 million viewers. So, from just ABC alone, Doctor Who didn't stand a chance in its 8pm time slot. NBC aired Third Rock from The Sun and Frasier, the latter of which gaining over 17 million viewers, and on CBS, their Tuesday night movie, The Stepford Husbands, gained an 11% audience share. So, amongst the major networks, unfortunately, Doctor Who would come out bottom of the pile. Naturally, this would have far-reaching and grave consequences for the programme's future, but more on that when we get there. The TV movie itself is often seen as a mixed bag. There are plenty of people who love it, and a fair amount of people who dislike it, and over the last 25 years, that split down the middle reputation hasn't changed a great deal. What I believe it overwhelmingly succeeds in, though, is being a rip-roaring good adventure. From start to finish, the pace never really lets up, and when it does slow down, you get some cracking character moments, particularly from Paul McGann as the Doctor and Daphne Ashbrook as Grace. Speaking of the leads, these two absolutely excel in their roles. Grace feels like a companion of the 90s. She's strong, determined, absolutely speaks her mind, and ultimately feels relatable. The stresses of trying to maintain your job as well as a love life, the fish-out-of-water feeling when confronted with something unusual, it all just comes across so naturally and effectively. As for Paul McGann, anyone who claims that he isn't a proper doctor, having only done a TV movie, is doing him an immense disservice. Already known for being a strong actor, McGann absolutely cements who the Eighth Doctor is in just under 90 minutes. He's a curious soul, delighting in the ordinary and extravagant, whilst also being immensely affectionate and sincere, caring with the desire to help others and to do a good job. A nice contrast from the more darker, manipulative undertones of his predecessor, especially when reading the expanded media of the day. Speaking of Sylvester, despite only being in the film's first act, he returns as if he's never been away. His seventh Doctor feels like he's lived and evolved through his life, and in a way, sort of acknowledges the long life he lived in the Virgin New Adventures, albeit indirectly. And we've got to talk about the Master, played for the first time with an American accent by Eric Roberts. I must admit, upon first viewing, I didn't really connect with this incarnation. But over time, I've grown to love the little absurdities and oddities that this Master showcases. The main gripe that many have with the TV movie arises from elements of the story. At the very beginning, the Master is executed by the Daleks. Uh, oh yeah, the Daleks are in this. Sort of. And then in his remains, he becomes a sort of snake? Demon? I, I'm not really sure. And the Eye of Harmony, a symbol of Gallifreyan power present on Gallifrey, is now in the TARDIS itself. Is the script perfect? Absolutely not. Philip Siegel even recalls that during production, daily script meetings were held as the various parties involved, like the BBC, Fox, Universal, etc., were constantly unhappy with certain elements. But despite these problems, I have a major soft spot for the TV movie. It's Doctor Who that I can switch my brain off to and have a thumping good time, and I think even today it holds up fairly well from a production standpoint. By the movie's end, you feel for Paul McGann, that he wasn't given another chance to really develop his Doctor. At least, not just yet. But more on that when we get there. If you'd like to experience the Eighth Doctor's one main solo outing for yourself, then you can read the novelization of the film, released in 1996, which subsequently got a reissue under the Target brand in 2021 with a corresponding audiobook. To watch it, you have the VHS release from 1996, the original Bare Bones DVD release from 2001, the expanded two-disc special edition release from 2010, which formed part of the Revisitations box set, and the TV movie is also available on Blu-ray, released as a two-disc set in 2016. Whether you love it or hate it, the TV movie succeeded in one fundamental aspect. It brought Doctor Who back to television screens on BBC One, and with 9 million viewers, it's clear that the show hadn't completely lost the interest of the general public just yet. So grab some snacks, sit on down, and enjoy 85 minutes of fun, adventure, and drama. All quintessential elements of some classic Doctor Who. But what happens now? Despite the relative success ratings-wise here in the UK, the lackluster performance in the US was more devastating. One month after the US premiere, Fox decided not to go with a new series of Doctor Who commissioning instead a third series of popular sci-fi series, Sliders. News of this began to trickle into the UK press, although initially it was still hoped that some sort of series could be produced in the near future. 
As fans continued to hope for a follow-up to the TV movie, the Virgin New Adventures line of books continued to issue new releases, still featuring Sylvester McCoy's Seventh Doctor. Throughout the latter half of 1996, there was still one new title a month, except for November, and these books were God Engine, Christmas on a Rational Planet, Return of the Living Dad, The Death of Art, Damaged Goods, and Bad Therapy. Amongst the many authors who contributed to the VNAs, one name you may have recognised there was Russell T Davis, then a young up-and-coming writer who, like many of the other authors, also was a massive Doctor Who fan. Fully embracing the darker side of storytelling that the VNAs had become known for, Damaged Goods is one of the highlights of the range, and was adapted into an audio drama by Big Finish Productions in 2015, so I highly recommend giving it a listen. But whilst the VNAs remain popular amongst Doctor Who fans, talks of the Eighth Doctor becoming the central protagonist within the range were beginning to circulate, though that realisation was still a little way off coming to fruition, but more on that when we get there. As for the Missing Adventures line, the remaining titles that came out during 1996 A Killing Ground, The Scales of Injustice, The Shadow of Wang Chiang, Twilight of the Gods, Speed of Flight, The Plotters, and Cold Fusion. So with all seven Doctors still getting new stories in print, the Eighth Doctor would duly receive the same treatment in the near future. Aside from the books, throughout the 1990s the VHS range had been a core factor in keeping the memory of Doctor Who alive, particularly amongst the casual viewer base. With several classic adventures now available on video, the range was set to continue into 1996. However, with the release of the TV movie upcoming, the decision was taken to suspend the range, supposedly so that the Eighth Doctor's debut could receive the prime focus. The previous year had seen 21 separate releases of Doctor Who VHS tapes from BBC Video, and in 1996, this number dropped down to just three. This would make it the quietest year for the range since 1989. The three releases that did make it to the shelves were The Hand of Fear, releasing in February, The Green Death, releasing in October, and the TV movie itself, which came out between the two. In addition to the suspension of the range, several titles within the catalogue were up for deletion. This included the recently released Hand of Fear, so whilst not being exceedingly rare, it's a Doctor Who VHS that you don't see pop up that often. There had been a further 10 stories planned for a release on video throughout 1996, but due to the suspension of the range, this didn't happen. Some of those planned titles would get their release as early as the following year, whereas some wouldn't hit the format until the early 2000s. The Green Death marked the first classic adventure to utilise the logo seen within the TV movie. Fitting, really, given that it's a reworking of the logo first seen for the majority of the Third Doctor's era. This release also had been a long time coming, originally having been slated for a 1994 release, which was cancelled after a repeat screening on BBC Two received low ratings. So at a time when Doctor Who arguably needed the extra support the most, especially during the uncertainty that followed the TV movies broadcast, the VHS range was largely absent. It would return to a more frequent release schedule for the remainder of the decade, but there'd be numerous changes in how the range was presented but more on that when we get there. By the end of 1996, it was sadly becoming clear that a new series of Doctor Who starring Paul McGann was not coming to fruition. Fans were beginning to worry that the dark days of the programme were not quite over yet, and sure enough, by the beginning of 1997, the world of Doctor Who would be plunged back into the wilderness years. The year is 1997, and after nearly a year since the TV movie, Doctor Who fans eagerly awaited news on their hero's further return to the small screen. Whilst the episode was a success here in the UK, the situation had been entirely different overseas. The 8.3 million American viewers who tuned in only made up around 9% of the audience, far from the 15% that Fox were after. Despite discussions taking place, it was ultimately decided that Doctor Who would not be renewed for a fresh season of new adventures, and instead, the TV movie would essentially become a pilot for a show that wouldn't exist. In the UK, given the rating success of Paul McGann's debut, you could perhaps forgive fans for thinking that this was finally it, that their beloved show would finally be making the triumphant return to television that it so rightly deserved. But by 1997, most of that renewed hope began to fade away once again, with fans realising that the wilderness years were once again looming over the Time Lord. But just like in the first half of the 1990s, Doctor Who wouldn't vanish entirely. It survived cancellation once before, why should this be any different? The VHS range of classic releases returned in January to pick up where they had left off. Those who were disappointed at the meagre three releases in 1996 would have been pleased that this number had been bumped to five. This is still a far cry from a few years previous, but the range was back up and running, and that's what mattered the most. God forbid if Doctor Who fans should have an incomplete collection. The five releases on VHS this year were 
the Leisure Hive, a double set of the Awakening and Frontios, the War Machines, the Happiness Patrol, and the eSpace Trilogy box set, comprising a Full Circle, State of Decay, and Warrior's Gate. The format and look of the tapes had changed once more, dropping the diamond logo that had been in use for well over a decade, adapting the one seen in the TV movie instead. There was also a change in style for the VHS range, with painted covers being dropped in favour of a photo montage design, which would continue for the remainder of the range's life. Well, what about the books? For much of the 1990s, The Virgin New Adventures, as well as The Missing Adventures, held up the flag for original Doctor Who content, continuing the story where the TV show had left off. While for the first part of 1997, the trend of one new release a month continued, with titles such as Eternity Weeps, The Room With No Doors, and the renowned or infamous title Lung Barrow, which is quite the read if you can get your hands on it. April's release would prove to be the last VNA, which was titled The Dying Days, and has the distinction of being the only book in the range to feature Paul McGann's 8th Doctor, instead of Sylvester McCoy's 7th. May 1997 saw the release of So Vile a Sin, a book that should have been published back in 1996, but The Dying Days technically, and numerically, is the last of the experimental VNAs. The incumbent Doctor's adventures would continue, but not with Virgin. With their license now expired, the BBC decided that any new original Doctor Who content in the printed medium would be handled by their own publishing imprint, BBC Books. Without missing a beat, the new line of Eighth Doctor adventures began in June 1997 with The Eight Doctors, penned by series legend Terence Dix. BBC Books would follow Virgin's example of one new release a month, 1997 giving us The Eight Doctors, Vampire Science, The Body Snatchers, Genocide, War of the Daleks, and Alien Bodies. As mentioned, The Missing Adventures, which had begun in 1994, continued also. Under Virgin's license, the 1997 releases were Burning Heart, A Device of Death, The Dark Path, and The Well-Mannered War. BBC Books decided to continue this range as well, with their 1997 releases being The Devil Goblins from Neptune, The Murder Game, The Ultimate Treasure, Business Unusual, Illegal Alien, and the Roundheads. So even when there was no new Who on telly, fans still had plenty to choose from when it came to new adventures. You could even decide to embark on a new adventure with the Doctor in the digital world. 1997 saw the release of the PC game, Destiny of the Doctors, which has gone on to quite some infamy for one reason or another. Whilst exceedingly primitive by today's standards, I'm sure this was, well, quite something back in the day. The highlights are arguably the live action segments, featuring none other than the Master played ever faithfully by Anthony Ainley. These scenes are brand new and campy as they are, they show just how deliciously Ainley took on the role as the renegade arch-rival to the Doctor. And sadly, Destiny of the Doctors would mark the final time that Anthony would play the role of the Master, before his death some years later, in 2004. And yet, despite no new series being commissioned, Doctor Who's 30 years of adventures was still being shown on television, courtesy of UK Gold. We've touched on this channel before, commenting how from 1992 all the way up until 2007, it regularly repeated Doctor Who, from as early as an unearthly child, all the way up until the TV movie itself. 1997 saw the programme bounce around UK Gold schedules, appearing sometimes on weekdays, but mainly settling on a Sunday morning slot for most of the omnibus repeats. Unfortunately, I can't find reliable data regarding the viewing figures for these stories, but we can assume that considering they'd been in fairly consistent rotation since 1992, that a decent amount of viewership was being built up. But even though the Doctor's adventures were available to view on UK Gold, or via VHS or off-air recordings people took at the time, it couldn't match the feeling of anticipating a brand new set of episodes on a Saturday night. Having been stringed along during the first half of the 90s before the TV movie came about, fans were probably a bit more prepared this time for a potentially long wait. Though this time, there was even more uncertainty and doubt as to whether the programme would ever return as a regularly produced TV show. The year is 1998, which in turn would mark Doctor Who's 35th anniversary. Now, looking at the history of the programme, you'd know that for most anniversaries, something special is always produced. The three Doctors marked 10 years, the five Doctors commemorated 20, Dimensions in Time may not have been the 30th anniversary special people had expected, or maybe even wanted, but it was something to enjoy nonetheless. So, what treats could we expect to mark 35 years? Well, for the most part, nothing. There were no repeats on BBC One or even BBC Two, no special programmes or documentaries. You'd be forgiven for thinking that the Beeb had completely passed the milestone by. 
That is unless you had access to BBC Choice, which was the corporation's first truly digital channel. The service launched in September 1998, and just a couple of months later, dedicated several nights to celebrating Doctor Who's 35th anniversary. Between the 22nd and 27th of November, an episode representing each of the eight Doctors, including Genesis of the Daleks in its entirety, again, and the 30 Years in the TARDIS documentary, well, it turned out to be quite the Who-filled week for fans who had access. Aside from Genesis, representing the fourth Doctor, the other stories to feature across the week were An Unearthly Child, the pilot version of Part 1, and then the final parts of Tomb of the Cybermen, The Demons, The Caves of Androzani, The Trial of a Time Lord, and The Curse of Fenric. Individual episodes may be an odd way to dip in, but it was something at least, and to top it off, special links were filmed with the seventh Doctor himself, Sylvester McCoy. Not only was it great to see him again, but he was placed within a brand new TARDIS control room, one that presented a rather interesting levitating console design, if only we had gotten to see it in the show proper. Like with UK Gold, reliable data regarding the viewing figures on BBC Choice is… scarce, but we know the digital channel had far less reach than the terrestrial and established BBC's 1 and 2, especially in its inaugural year. There would be sporadic Doctor Who repeats on BBC Choice over the next few years, up until the service closed down in 2003, to be replaced by BBC3, which would go on to be a key player in the world of Doctor Who some years later, but we aren't quite there yet. When it came to home media, the long-standing VHS range continued to bulk back up after the hiatus in 1996. Five releases made their way onto store shelves in 1997, and this number would rise to seven for 1998. The classic stories released onto VHS were Time Lash, Battlefield, the Mind of Evil, albeit in black and white, Horror of Fang Rock, Planet of Fire, The Ark, and a special box set of The Ice Warriors, which contained the then sole surviving episode of The Underwater Menace, as well as a new documentary, The Missing Years, which was dedicated to the program's lost episodes. Whilst the amount of releases weren't as plentiful as in the first half of the 90s, there would be some good reason for this. The amount of available releases that BBC Video could draw from was beginning to dwindle, so plans would have to be made to either eke out the range for as long as possible, or to perhaps embrace an entirely new format, one that was beginning to rise in popularity, maybe even spelling the end of the old faithful videotape. But of course, more on that when we get there. New Adventures with the Eighth Doctor continued under BBC Books, with one new release every month throughout 1998. These releases were Cursal, Option Lock, Longest Day, Legacy of the Daleks, Dreamstone Moon, Seeing Eye, Placebo Effect, Van Der Deacon's Children, The Scarlet Empress, The Janus Conjunction, and Bell Tempest. If you wanted to check in with any of the first seven Doctors in print, BBC Books offered the following past adventures. The Face of the Enemy, Eye of Heaven, The Witch Hunters, The Hollow Men, Catastrophea, Mission Impractical, Zeta Major, Dreams of Empire, Last Man Running, Matrix, and the Infinity Doctors. It's nice to see that even in the franchise's 35th anniversary year, despite no major special events on television, the Doctor still was very much having brand new adventures we could enjoy, whether in print or via the ever-continuing comic strip in Doctor Who magazine, which had been featuring the 8th Doctor front and centre since late 1996. DWM also celebrated the 35th anniversary, as you'd expect, but overall, when looking back, this was probably one of the quietest milestone years for Doctor Who. It's understandable to some extent, with it looking unlikely that the show would ever return as a TV series, the BBC didn't have the biggest drive or incentive to make a thing of it. The fact they dedicated a week of repeats on their digital channel is at the very least something, but the vast majority of Brits wouldn't have had access to the service, never mind whether they'd be interested in tuning in or not. UK Gold ran repeats all throughout 1998, with even the black and white era getting a look in for the first time in many years, as well as the TV movie making its debut on the channel in February but even they didn't do any special sort of evening or event to mark the programme's 35th birthday. Small celebrations aside, Doctor Who's legacy continued on, with the new millennium fast approaching. The year is 1999, and whilst the 35th anniversary year may have been a quiet one overall, this year would prove to be a very different story indeed. Alongside the usual releases of the new VHS tapes or books, there would be a brand new format for fans to sink their teeth into, and even a brand new televised adventure, but not perhaps in the traditional sense you may be expecting. The spring would herald the comic relief event hosted by the BBC, and with it, Doctor Who would make a grand return, 
with several new actors playing the iconic Time Lord. The Doctor Who comic relief special is The Curse of Fatal Death. The Doctor informs the Master that he intends to give up his travels to marry his companion, Emma. On the planet Tursurus, the Doctor and the Master compete to outwit each other, but the Doctor is finally outmaneuvered and is taken prisoner by the Daleks. This story was originally broadcast as four mini-episodes, ranging from five to seven minutes in length on Friday the 12th of March 1999, as part of that year's comic relief. Here are the viewing figures for this adventure, and we can see that these numbers are decently high, Doctor Who having not reached this level in its regular run for years before it had been cancelled. The first mini-episode was the strongest, sitting just under 10 million, with not a vast drop-off for the second instalment. The third suffered the biggest drop, more than 3.5 million viewers dipping, before many of them returned for the final part. It's certainly an intriguing set of viewing figures considering all four went out on the same evening, not too far from each other time-wise, so why were they not more consistent across the board? Well, one important factor is to take into account the structure of the Comic Relief Telethon itself. Spread out across the entire evening, Doctor Who, whilst being one of the main events of the night, had to share the stage with several other specially shot segments, celebrity guests, and so on. Perhaps to echo the original series style of multiple episodes, the story was split into four, the first airing at around 10 past 8, and the last beginning towards 10 past 10. Highs and lows throughout Comic Relief, or indeed any charity telethon, are quite common and are to be expected to some extent, but why were Part 3's figures so drastically lower compared to the others? Well, you see, even though it does go on for several hours, Comic Relief does have to dip out for the news, and at 9pm, it did exactly that. Many switch over to different channels during the news, and likely forgot or just didn't tune back into BBC One once the bulletin had concluded, arguably causing this vast drop for Part 3. However, it's reassuring to see that the vast majority of those viewers did tune back into the Beeb, with Part 4 recovering almost all of the audience that it had lost. But as we know, it's not just scheduling within the BBC that matters, but also what's on the other side. What was its competition? Considering by 1999 there were hundreds of channels available, we're going to focus mainly on the BBC's long-standing rival, that being ITV. The other side had scheduled a DIY show, with Carol Vorderman, against the Doctor's opening episode and although Carol brought in over 9 million viewers, she was just ever so slightly eclipsed by the curse of fatal death. However, once Who Wants to Be a Millionaire came on at 9pm, it comfortably blew Doctor Who out of the water, bringing in an impressive 14.5 million viewers. Staggering numbers for a quiz show. I'd hazard a guess that's what the millions who left BBC One just before the news were switching over to, and though Millionaire is a brilliant show, it would have been nice if the Doctor's long-awaited return had been able to push into double figures. Promotion is another factor we must look into. Being tied with Comic Relief, and one of the headliners in fact, The Curse of Fatal Death received a healthy bout of promotion. Doctor Who magazine gave it a front cover spot, and the Radio Times, the leading television listings magazine, gave it a good deal of coverage weeks before broadcast. The main appeal was arguably that Rowan Atkinson, of Mr. Beam fame, would be taking the controls of the TARDIS as the Ninth Doctor. Yes, you read that correctly. Atkinson wasn't the only big name to be tied with the special either as Jonathan Price, who hadn't long starred as a villain in the James Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies, would be taking on the role of the Master. Julia Sawala would play Emma, the Doctor's companion, and later fiancé, don't worry, we'll get to that, and there were a few twists and turns that viewers could expect throughout the adventure. The Curse of Fatal Death is a beautiful oddity in the Doctor Who universe. It's very clearly a parody, with wobbly sets, all the tropes and cliches that the programme would get lambasted for, and yet, there's a part of it that treats itself completely seriously, regardless of cheap production or iffy dialogue. Speaking of the dialogue, you may be interested to know that this adventure was written by a writer known as Stephen Moffat. I wonder if we'll ever hear from him again in the future. He clearly knows his Doctor Who, as all the tropes that are picked on feel deliciously right for the programme, and the references are clearly from a fan who knows their stuff. In terms of performances, Rowan Atkinson is memorable right from the off, delivering that British eccentricity he's so well known for, and would arguably make a cracking doctor. Jonathan Price is clearly relishing the chance to play the master, and even in the more silly moments, like the aging hundreds of years after falling into a sewer, or wearing the etheric beam locators, he's not shying away from making it as hilarious as possible. But remember how I mentioned about twists and turns in the story? Well, in the latter half, the ninth doctor is duly exterminated, regenerating into his tenth incarnation, played by Richard E. Grant. This Doctor is confident, sexy, and lick the mirror handsome? Whatever that means. 
but after some sexual innuendos, this Doctor is struck down too, with Jim Broadbent emerging as the 11th Doctor. He's completely shy around women, jeopardising his and Emma's future marriage, but he too falls to bad wiring, becoming a rather dashing Hugh Grant. When all seems sorted out, a blast of energy hits him, destroying his ability to regenerate, and even though this is a comedy, we get one of my absolute favourite lines. He was never cruel and never cowardly, and it'll never be safe to be scared again. But wait, there's more. The Doctor in fact does regenerate, this time into a woman, Joanna Lumley to be precise, the 13th Doctor. A blonde woman as the 13th Doctor. Sounds familiar somehow. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.4 million viewers. This is more than half a million lower than what the TV movie achieved back in 1996, and of course a few million lower than the masterpiece that is Dimensions in Time, but when compared to Doctor Who's original 26-year run on BBC One, this is the best average and adventure it achieved since Time Flight brought season 19 to a close in 1982, with just under 9 million viewers tuning in. Not bad at all for a comedy special. At its heart, The Curse of Fatal Death is a lot of fun. It's a celebration of Doctor Who, but also isn't afraid to poke fun at it. Its tongue is firmly in cheek, and it's also very, very funny. It's not the Doctor Who you may be used to, but it's a hilarious sidestep that deserves the praise it gets. If you'd like to check it out, it's freely available to watch on YouTube, from the official Comic Relief channel. However, if you'd like to own it on home media, there's really only one option available to you, and that's on good old VHS this tape releasing a few months after broadcast in 1999. It contains not only The Curse of Fatal Death, but other gems that link Doctor Who and Comic Relief in some way, and it's a fun little item to have in your collection. As of 2024, it's never been released on DVD, but you never know, maybe it'll appear in one of the Blu-ray collection sets one day. But if you've never seen it before, or wish to show people who haven't, get ready for a mini-adventure full of laughs, gags, and many, many Doctors. Tell me, why do they call you the master? I'll explain later. <laughs> Just as fans have become accustomed to throughout the 1990s, the final decade of the year wouldn't disappoint when it came to home media, with eight releases on VHS becoming available for purchase. These titles were Nightmare of Eden, The Keys of Marinus, yet another re-release of Revenge of the Cybermen, this one in episodic form, the Face of Evil, a box set featuring the Space Museum, and the two surviving episodes of The Crusade, Terror of the Zygons, a re-release presented in episodic form, a beautifully produced Dalek tin featuring Revelation of the Daleks and Planet of the Daleks, the latter mostly being presented in colour, with episode 3 being in black and white. But perhaps the most anticipated release of 1999 for Doctor Who fans was The Curse of Fatal Death. This would have been a welcome surprise, as sometimes charity specials for one reason or another cannot be released on home video. But whilst the VHS range continued, Doctor Who would embrace another format in 1999, a newer digital format, one that boasted incredible capabilities, all stored onto a CD-sized disc. This, of course, was the DVD. Having first been introduced in 1996, DVD, like most new video formats, took some time to catch on with the public. Its capabilities were certainly impressive, with the quality it offered blowing anything VHS could achieve out of the water. So with fewer past adventures to release on VHS, it makes sense that BBC Video decided that they could issue out the Doctor's adventures all over again on the digital versatile disc. And so they would, as in November 1999, the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors, would become the first story to be released onto DVD. It boasted a flashy 3D menu based around the TARDIS console, included the 1995 special edition of the story that released to VHS some years prior, and even contained special features, one of the standout new abilities offered by DVD. By today's standard, this release is, well, far from perfect, but the team putting out the DVDs would begin to refine and perfect the look, feel, and functionality of the Doctor Who range once the new millennium came around. The Eighth Doctor may have only had one title to release on VHS, but his catalogue of adventures was growing quickly when it came to original books. The releases that dropped in 1999 were The Face Eater, The Taint, Demontage, Revolution Man, Dominion, Unnatural History, Autumn Mist, Interference Books 1 and 2, The Blue Angel, The Taking of Planet 5, and Frontier Worlds. The past adventures range was also expanding quickly, with its 1998 releases being Salvation, The Wages of Sin, Deep Blue, Players, Millennium Shock, 
Storm Harvest, The Final Sanction, City at World's End, Divided Loyalties, and Corpse Marker. Original Doctor Who adventures were still going strong for all eight incarnations, but further trips in the TARDIS were about to occur in another realm altogether. Big Finish productions had been operating since 1996, and from 1998 had been producing their own original audio drama adventures, featuring Bernice Summerfield as the central character. Benny had been created for the Virgin New Adventures range back in the early 90s, and had become so popular that she seemed like a natural choice to lead the range, especially when Big Finish was still negotiating with the BBC about acquiring the official Doctor Who license. Well, in 1999, they got that license, and in the summer, The Sirens of Time would become the first original Doctor Who audio drama to be produced by Big Finish. Together with Phantasmagoria and Whispers of Terror, these three 1999 releases would kickstart a range of monthly stories that would last for more than two decades, and opening up a whole world of adventures for not just the Doctor, but for any character within the Hooniverse. As the show's birthday approached in November, a rather special evening was trailered to be taking place on BBC Two. On Saturday, the 13th of November, from 8.55pm until half past midnight, BBC Two was completely dedicated to Doctor Who, with a Dalek-themed ident to boot. The night was chock full of goods, including an introduction presented by Tom Baker, comedy skits featuring actors such as Mark Gattis and David Walliams, documentaries on the history of the show, and some of the famous monsters that had appeared, and of course, screenings of classic episodes. The final episode of the first Dalek serial was chosen as one of them, with it attracting around 1.6 million viewers. It's rather a low figure for 1999 standards, but it went out past 10pm and really would have only been appealing to the core Doctor Who fan demographic. The story had been available on home video for a decade, and had been repeated on UK Gold on a number of occasions. Even though it didn't crack BBC Two's top 30 programmes for the week, certain elements of Doctor Who Night did. The Carnival of Monsters documentary, with an audience of 2.37 million, finished 24th, and the Adventures in Time and Space one that preceded it placed at 22nd, with an audience of 2.47 million. The night closed off with a screening of the uncut version of the TV movie, which had some parts originally censored here in the UK. This repeat broadcast attracted 1.4 million viewers, which is lower than the 60s Dalek episode, but keep in mind the TV movie began just after 11pm, and with the story readily available on home video, there may have been less incentive to watch. In terms of competition, one of the biggest that Doctor Who Night faced was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, then in its infancy, and was pulling well over 10 million viewers with nearly every episode. Following it was an audience with Cliff Richard, the pop star also pulling in more than 10 million viewers. So it's fair to say that The Doctor, The Daleks and all of the new material face some pretty stiff competition. But regardless, Doctor Who Night was a pilot of sorts, at least when it came to the programme on BBC Two. Behind the scenes, restoration efforts were being carried out on some of the early colour stories from the John Pertwee era. And just a few days after Doctor Who Night, the first of these serials would be cleaned up and would debut on BBC Two kickstarting what was envisaged to be a lengthy tenure on the established channel. The repeat season kicked off with Spearhead from Space, the first John Pertwee story, and the first colour adventure to boot. Here are the viewing figures for this repeat, which averaged out at 2.61 million viewers. Granted, none of the four episodes were able to surpass the 3 million mark, and after episodes 1 and 2, shown on the same night as a double bill, the numbers gradually fall throughout the rest of the story. Even with all of the added choice in television available in 1999, Surfing below 3 million viewers was not necessarily the best result or the best look. One small saving grace, however, is that all four episodes made BBC Two's top 30 programmes for their respective weeks. Episodes 1 and 2 both finished at 19th, Episode 3 lowered down at 26th, and Episode 4 almost dropping out completely at 29th. Primarily going out at 6pm, therefore against many news programmes, the repeat's chances may have always had a thorn in their side. And whilst it's unclear what the BBC were expecting or hoping viewing figure-wise, this grand start to what was set to be a lengthy marathon of Doctor Who was not the popular beginning that they needed. The repeats continued with Doctor Who and the Silurians, the next story chronologically, and the first colour seven-parter. Now, unfortunately, the viewing figures data for this particular repeat is unavailable, but based on what came just before and what was to come, we can only assume that the numbers perhaps began at a similar level before dropping. A seven-part story that's already 30 years old, one episode a week, and that's a big commitment. And considering the vast amount of choice the British public now had, even though the repeat was being hosted on the well-established BBC Two, that honour alone never guaranteed success. When checking available data, 
None of the Silurian seven episodes made the top 30 programs for BBC Two in their week of broadcast, which suggests that they fell under the 2 million mark at some point. The repeat of the Silurians would conclude in January of 2000, and what was to follow in this line wasn't perhaps what the BBC originally had in mind. But as the Silurians helped who fans see out 1999 and the 20th century as a whole, despite the dawn of a new millennium being a generally exciting time for many, it was quite the opposite for any Whovian. With no firm news from the BBC that the show would receive another reprieve, you could be forgiven for assuming that going forward, you'd have to rely on existing adventures from the original series, or new adventures in either print or audio. Not a bad future, by any means, after all the legacy of Doctor Who was living on, but deep down, every fan secretly hoped that the show would return to TV in some way, at some point. The year is 2000. The new millennium had dawned. After realising that we weren't all going to be wiped out by the millennium bug, Doctor Who fans emerged once more with a thin hope that their beloved show would get another chance. Though as time went on, that hope wasn't fuelled by any random rumour that circulated. They'd been burned before, and after four years since Paul McGann took the reins, it looked as if the TV movie may well and truly have been a sort of swan song for the famous Time Lord. However, early into the year 2000, the Doctor would return to BBC television, though not in the manner originally planned. When the recent run of repeats had started towards the end of 1999, the original plan had been to air every colour story chronologically, starting with Spearhead from Space and working all the way up until Survival, presumably. We saw how things began with Spearhead from Space and Doctor Who and the Silurians, but things took a sharp turn in the new year. The viewing figures for these first two repeats, well, they were lacklustre, to say the least. So in a panic, instead of screening the Ambassadors of Death, the BBC decided to jump right on ahead to the Tom Baker era, to Genesis of the Daleks in particular. You heard me right, Genesis of the Daleks, yet again. Like the Silurians, there is no available ratings data for this one, and again, none of the six episodes appear on the top 30 programs list for BBC Two, implying that viewership stayed under 2 million, or perhaps sunk even lower, maybe even ending up below 1 million. The story was undeniably a popular one in the Doctor Who lineup, frequently cited as one of the best, but by 2000 it had already seen numerous repeats on BBC television, and had been widely available on VHS for almost a decade. Whatever the result, the viewing figures for Genesis had been so poor that the BBC decided to scrap any further planned Doctor Who repeats they had initially lined up. This great repeat season on BBC Two, aiming to get through every colour story, was now dead in the water after just three serials had gone out to air. Perhaps the public well and truly had finished with reminiscing, and were turning on their televisions to watch something new. With the 21st century having finally arrived, despite big changes in the world, this wouldn't stop the near 20-year-old Doctor Who VHS line from trundling onwards. Six different releases would come out in the year 2000, these being The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, The Invasion of Time, The Edge of Destruction, paired together with the show's pilot episode, Time Flight, a remastered version of An Unearthly Child, and a special Cyberman-themed tin, featuring Attack of the Cybermen and the Tenth Planet, the missing final episode presented as a reconstruction. As more and more gaps began to be filled on fan shelves, those who maybe passed the first time could be tempted by the new DVD format. The Five Doctors may have been the first Doctor Who DVD to market in 1999, but the sole release from 2000 ushered in many of the common templates we would see throughout the new range. The design of the cover, the menu system, these would become hallmarks and staples of the DVD range for more than a decade. The Robots of Death, the story chosen to be released in November 2000, was only just the beginning, but more on that when we get there. Meanwhile, in the print world, the Eighth Doctor continued his run of original adventures. Stories fans could enjoy during 2000 included Parallel 59, The Shadows of Avalon, The Fall of Yequitain, Cold Heart, The Space Age, The Banquo Legacy, The Ancestor Cell, The Burning, Casualties of War, The Turing Test, an endgame. The Doctor's first seven incarnations enjoyed their own adventures, with releases such as Last of the Gadarene, Tomb of the Valdmar, Verdigris, Grave Matter, Heart of Tardis, Prime Time, Imperial Moon, Festival of Death, Independence Day, and The King of Terror. But alongside the shelf space needed for these books, if fans wanted to consume all original adventures being made, they'd have to make some CD space. Big Finish Productions entered full swing with their monthly range, creating brand new audio adventures for the 5th, 6th and 7th Doctors, with all three original actors returning to reprise their roles. The stories released in 2000 were 
The Land of the Dead, The Fearmonger, The Marion Conspiracy, The Genocide Machine, Red Dawn, The Spectre of Lanyon Moor, Winter for the Adept, The Apocalypse Element, The Fires of Vulcan, The Shadow of the Scourge, The Holy Terror, and The Mutant Phase. Many of these early adventures would go on to be regarded as true classics, a bright sign of the output that was to come in the audio drama world. So as 2000 drew to an end, there was a wider spark in the expanded universe of Doctor Who. With new adventures now being delivered via audio dramas as well as published books, fans had more choice than ever, and looked ahead to the new year to see just how that expanded universe would continue to grow. The year is 2001, and Doctor Who's profile, on television at least, continued to grow ever smaller. Aside from the occasional appearance as the butt of a joke or as part of a skit, or even in some adverts, there were no repeats on BBC television throughout the year. You can forgive them somewhat, given how far the viewing figures fell during the repeats from 1999 and 2000. After that showing, you'd expect the BBC not to go down that route again, at least for some time. The only outlet on the small screen was primarily via UK Gold, now entering its ninth full year of showcasing Doctor Who. The channel was consistent, broadcasting omnibus editions of all the colour stories going out on weekend mornings. 2001 began with Invasion of the Dinosaurs on the 7th of January and ran chronologically all the way until Paradise Towers, which saw out the year on the 30th of December. So even if the BBC wouldn't go to any graces in airing its back catalogue, at least viewers could rely on UK Gold to pick up the slack, or they could build a library of tales from the TARDIS themselves, even on a newer format. Despite DVD continuing to escalate in popularity, VHS was still very much a viable and popular format in 2001. Even though the well of past adventures was fast running dry, seven releases still made it to market. These were a remastered version of the Daleks, Delta and the Bannermen, a re-release of City of Death, The Sunmakers, Fort to Doomsday, a master theme set featuring Colony in Space and the Time Monster, but the biggest release of the year was perhaps the Davros Collection. Even though the five stories in it were all re-releases, having all the Davros-centric adventures collated into one set would have been incredibly exciting for any Doctor Who fan in 2001. The collection was limited to just 10,000 copies, presented in quite the striking package. Even though it's been superseded by DVD or Blu-ray releases, some fans still hold on to this once iconic set. Speaking of DVDs, 2001 marked the first year in which more than one Doctor Who release would hit the format. Five titles in total arrived on disc, these being Spearhead from Space, Remembrance of the Daleks, The Caves of Androzani, the TV movie, and Vengeance on Barros. These five releases seem quite bare bones in terms of their additional content by today's standards, and all five would ultimately see beefed up re-releases in the coming years. But it's a solid starting lineup, choosing popular or significant stories from a variety of Doctors, as well as the TV movie, at that time still the most recent main televised episode. Paul McGann, however, was still viewed by the majority as the incumbent Doctor, and the BBC books range definitely reflected as such. The batch of new adventures to reach print in 2001 were Escape Velocity, Earthworld, Vanishing Point, Eater of Wasps, The Year of Intelligent Tigers, The Slow Empire, Dark Progeny, The City of the Dead, Grim Reality, and The Adventures of Henrietta Street. Doctors 1 to 7 got their share of new material, including titles such as The Quantum Archangel, Bunker Soldiers, Rags, The Shadow in the Glass, Asylum, Superior Beings, Byzantium, Bullet Time, The Science Fiction, Dying in the Sun, and Instruments of Darkness. In the world of audio drama, Big Finish's monthly range continued, now with Paul McGann joining as the Eighth Doctor, the first time reprising his role since his TV debut back in 1996. Titles this year were Storm Warning, Sword of Orion, The Stones of Venice, Minuet in Hell, Lugaru, Dust Breeding, Blood Tide, Project Twilight, The Eye of the Scorpion, Colditz, Primeval, and The One Doctor. The former Gan adventures from 2001 went down a treat, introducing the original character of Charlie Pollard, who had quickly become a fan favourite, played wonderfully by India Fisher. With 2001 marking Paul McGann's official return to the role of the 8th Doctor, fans were hopeful that over the next few years he would continue to produce more original adventures alongside a slew of original companions, just as his predecessors had done. But whilst matters were alive and well in the audio world, the year closed out with no official news of a return to television. Though that didn't mean cogs weren't slowly turning behind the scenes, but more on that when we get there.
The year is 2002, and as Doctor Who approached its 40th anniversary, there were still no major signs of a revival for the programme. Its profile in the mainstream continued to diminish, becoming the subject of ridicule once again. No more was this emphasised than by Michael Grade's appearance on Room 101. The former BBC One controller lambasted the programme, much to the delight of the audience, and the public mood at the time largely reflected his words. Not to be put down, however, the franchise pushed on, and if the BBC wasn't going to make a big push for television, just as always, it would be other forms of media that would keep the flame of Doctor Who alive. UK Gold celebrated 10 years of repeating Doctor Who, not by actually doing any special events, but by doing what it always did, reach the end of the run with survival, and then starting back at the beginning of the colour stories with Spearhead from Space. It was a tried and true formula, but at this point, a decade in, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 2002 would mark the final year in which Doctor Who VHS releases would outnumber those seen on DVD. There weren't many titles left to issue on tape, and the format itself was gradually losing its market share to the DVD piece by piece. The seven releases to reach VHS in 2002 were Planet of Giants, Underworld, The Ambassadors of Death, The Creature from the Pit, The Invisible Enemy, The Time Lord Collection, which contained re-releases of The War Games, The Three Doctors and The Deadly Assassin, and finally, a special First Doctor box set, featuring the last three complete adventures featuring William Hartnell that hadn't yet been released to tape. These stories were The Sensorites, The Time Meddler, and The Gunfighters. But whereas one range was reaching its conclusion, another was continuing to blossom and grow. Five new DVDs were released, these being The Tomb of the Cybermen, The Ark in Space, Carnival of Monsters, The Aztecs, and Resurrection of the Daleks. All five would receive expanded special editions many years later. It's fascinating to see Doctor Who healthily occupy two different formats, and it makes you wonder how long fans were willing to cling on to the older VHS for sake of completing their collections. Even though we don't have reliable sales data for every release, it would be curious to see how much VHS dwindled off as the 2000s progressed and the DVD began to take over. Books were still very much king, at least in terms of new original adventures for the Doctor in all of their incarnations. New stories for the 8th Doctor in 2002 included Mad Dogs and Englishmen, Hope, Anarchophobia, Trading Futures, The Book of the Still, The Crooked World, History 101, Camera Obscura, Time Zero, and The Infinity Race. For the Doctors before McGann, there was Relative Dementius, Drift, Palace of the Red Sun, A Morality Tale, Warmonger, Ten Little Aliens, Combat Rock, The Sons of Karesh, and Heritage. Complementing the books in terms of new adventures was of course Big Finish. Their monthly output for Doctors 5 to 8 in 2002 included Invaders from Mars, The Chimes of Midnight, Seasons of Fear, Embrace the Darkness, The Time of the Daleks, Neverland, Spare Parts, Ish, The Rapture, The Sandman, The Church and the Crown, and Bang Bang A Boom which is essentially Doctor Who meets Eurovision and is like the most glorious thing ever. By this point, it was becoming clear that Big Finish, like the books before them, were willing to experiment and push the boundaries with Doctor Who, telling darker or more experimental stories, some of which when you listen to, you'd think of never have made it past the BBC bosses. 2002 had been another great year for original Doctor Who content, and fans were lapping up as much as they could. I'm sure some had given up the prospect of their favourite show returning to its rightful home on the small screen, but if 2002 had been yet another year of disappointment, then 2003 was going to be proven as one hell of a year for the Hooniverse. The year is 2003, and boy this was the big one, Doctor Who's 40th anniversary. Granted, it had been off the air for 14 of those years, but it had always remained in some form alive. As we've discovered, whether it was via VHS, original new books or audios, the Doctor and his many friends and foes never truly faded away. This certainly was true of the UK Gold repeats, which continued on as ever throughout 2003, showing all the colour stories from 1970 until 1989. Over the 40th anniversary weekend itself, it hosted a Doctor Who at 40 event, dedicating most of its schedule to the programme. For the first time in many years, BBC Television would join in with the celebrations, but we'll touch on that in just a little bit. After 20 years, 2003 would finally mark the end of the Doctor Who VHS range. It was bound to happen eventually, with the newer DVD continuing to grow in popularity, stripping away VHS sales more and more with each passing year. The final five titles to be released on VHS were as follows. The Mutants, Meglos, The Horms of Naimon, 
Invasion of the Dinosaurs, which was the last complete adventure to be issued on tape, complete with a nice little dedication to the range in the sleeve notes. But the final release, full stop, would be this set, centred around the Reign of Terror and containing the surviving episodes for the Faceless Ones and the Web of Fear. This set was released around the time of Doctor Who's 40th anniversary, fitting perhaps that a home video range that began during anniversary celebrations should finish during another round of them. But even though the Doctor Who VHS range was now complete, or as complete as it could have been for 2003, the DVD range still had plenty of room to grow and fill the shelves of fans and collectors all over again. This would also be the DVD range's biggest yet, with eight titles released. These were The Seeds of Death, The Talons of Wang Chiang, The Dalek Invasion of Earth, Earthshock, The Two Doctors, The Curse of Fenric, a special Dalek Collector's release featuring Dalek adventures from the 1st, 5th and 7th Doctors, but the final DVD release of 2003 holds the most special place for me, as it's a release of The Three Doctors. This was the first ever classic Doctor Who DVD I ever owned, receiving it in late 2005, and as a new, eager young fan wishing to learn and watch all he could about the show's history, I couldn't have asked for a better introduction. So, all told, 2003 was a very significant year for Doctor Who on home media, the VHS range completing its run and bowing out after 20 years, and the DVD range experiencing its biggest year yet. The writing was well and truly on the wall that the digital versatile disc was here to stay, and Doctor Who had a long life ahead with it. Even though 2003 marked the 40th anniversary of Doctor Who, it didn't necessarily mean all departments were firing off on all cylinders. The BBC Books division is a prime example, whom instead of releasing one new 8th Doctor adventure a month as they had done for several years, put out just five novels throughout 2003. These were The Domino Effect, Reckless Engineering, The Last Resort, Timeless, and Emotional Chemistry. The past adventures line suffered a similar fate, with just six releases. These being Fear of the Dark, Blue Box, Loving the Alien, The Colony of Lies, Wolfsbane, and Deadly Reunion. Even though the output of new books was slowing, Big Finish continued to release a brand new audio adventure every month of the year. 2003's releases were Jubilee, Necromantia, The Dark Flame, Doctor Who and the Pirates, Creatures of Beauty, Project Lazarus, Flip Flop, Omega, Davros, Master, Zagreus, The Wormery, and Shirtso. This year's lineup has so many unique and fantastic adventures. Zagreus is a bonkers yet brilliant tribute to the program's 40th anniversary, Shirtso kicks off a step into another universe, and played to perfection by Paul McGann and India Fisher, whereas Jubilee would go on to inspire a pretty significant story in just a few years' time. But more on that when we get there. During the summer, a rather interesting announcement was made by the BBC. Doctor Who would return, but not as a television series, not even as a live-action series. Instead, it would be returning as a Flash animated series, with Richard E. Grant to star as the Doctor, and for it to be produced by BBC I, the corporation's internet-based division. There had been original Doctor Who webcasts handled by BBC I before, such as Death Comes to Time from 2001, Real Time in 2002, and an updated version of the unbroadcast Sharda in 2003, featuring the 8th Doctor instead of the 4th. But they contained a rather limited animation style, whereas this promised to take things to the next level. The premiere story, Scream of the Shalker, would be comprised of six 15-minute long episodes, and debut on the Doctor Who website across November and December. Keep in mind, this was 2003, a time when many an internet user was still mostly relying on dial-up. It would take some time for these stories to buffer and load, even if they were made using Flash. But still, new Doctor Who was better than no Doctor Who, and this animated medium could open the door to some exciting possibilities down the line. Furthermore, fans took note that in much of the promotion for Schalke, Richard E. Grant was being specifically billed as the Ninth Doctor, implying this animated form would continue the story from Paul McGann's Eighth Doctor and fit into the overall continuity of the programme at large. People seemed to be on board with this, in principle, and I suppose after nearly a decade of silence from the BBC regarding Doctor Who's official continuation, why not continue the story with a new numbered incarnation? This would have all played out fine if it wasn't for an announcement that the BBC themselves would make just a few months later. On the 26th of September, 2003, the news that fans had been waiting for for almost 15 years was finally heard. The BBC announced that Doctor Who would be returning to TV as a fully-fledged 13-episode series under the command and stewardship of one Russell T Davies, with filming due to begin the following year. 
To say this came out of nowhere is an understatement. Whilst Russell had been building his case to revive Doctor Who for some time, little of it had been publicised. So after years and years of absolutely nothing from the BBC, not even an inkling towards a new show, to have them suddenly announce its return mere months before its 40th anniversary seemed like a dream come true. But as exciting as this news was, an immediate flood of questions began to circulate amongst fans and the mainstream press alike. Who was going to be the new Doctor? Would McGann return to film a regeneration? Who would be the companion? What would the TARDIS look like? Would the Daleks return? How would the show be formatted? The list honestly could have gone on and on. Regardless of the speculation and theory, Doctor Who was officially and undeniably coming back to its rightful home on BBC One's Saturday Night lineup. But before this new version of the show could arrive, there was a rather special birthday to celebrate first. November 2003, the 40th anniversary month itself. Doctor Who made an appearance on Children in Need that year, albeit in the form of a comedy sketch, featuring several past Doctors and Monsters cropping up on a spoof version of the hit game show, The Weakest Link. We've already talked about this segment in way more depth than probably is sane to, so feel free to go out and check it if you're interested. But of course, the main event that fans were looking forward to was the rolling out of the new animated adventure, Scream of the Schalke. The six episodes were published weekly on Thursdays between the 13th of November and the 18th of December 2003. The Flash animated format may look a bit gaudy more than 20 years on, but at the time it was lauded for being impressive given the technology and budget available to the production team. And remember, this was commissioned at a time when Doctor Who on TV seemed like a distant memory, so Schalke may well have been the only new visual adventure for quite some time. The story for me personally is… alright. Don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed my time with it, but were these able to be regular 25 minute episodes, I think the story and characters could have been fleshed out a lot more. Richard E. Grant's take on the Doctor is an interesting one. I'd definitely be open to seeing more of him by story's end, and it's key to point out that this incarnation was billed officially as the Ninth Doctor. Now, had the revival on TV not been announced, fans may have been content with this, but now was the Schalke Doctor officially the Ninth, or would the new TV Doctor be the Tenth? Fans would once again have to play the waiting game before a true answer would be given. Although perceived by many as an oddity today, Scream of the Schalke is still worth giving a look in. If nothing else, it represented the route that Doctor Who could have embarked on had the television series not been revived by the BBC. If you'd like to check it out these days, it did receive a DVD release in 2013, which comes with a bunch of special features, so that's the route I'd recommend. It was novelised a few months after broadcast in early 2004, so if you'd like to check out the print version, you'll have to hit up the second-hand bookshops. As if 2003 couldn't have got any better for Doctor Who, a brand new hour-long documentary in celebration of the programme, its 40th anniversary, and its recently announced return was screened on BBC One on the 30th of December. The story of Doctor Who contained brand new interviews with several stars from across the show's history, explaining the brilliance and impact that Doctor Who has had since its launch in 1963. Many may have preferred 30 years in the TARDIS, but the story of Doctor Who is a perfectly serviceable documentary, and to be screened on BBC One, the flagship channel of the corporation, may truly be a sign that the BBC were taking Doctor Who seriously again. But we still had more than a year to wait before this new series would debut, so what was to come in the meantime? The year is 2004, and Doctor Who as a franchise was the most talked about it had been in nearly a decade. The announcement that a brand new series was in production fueled not just the fandom, but the mainstream press and even swaths of casual viewers also. Sure, there was still an amount of joking and ridicule going on, but many were excited at how a new series would look, sound and feel when viewing. But perhaps the question on most people's lips was, who would play the Doctor? Everyone would have to wait a couple of months into 2004 before they found out. But amidst all this excitement, how did the wide world of Doctor Who across different mediums fare? After five years of coexisting with the established VHS range, 2004 would mark the first year in which DVD was the sole format releasing past Doctor Who adventures to eager fans. Even though many had already owned the stories on tape, the extensive restorations, together with the increasing amount of special features included, made the upgrade seem like more than a worthwhile purchase to many. Six stories were issued on disc during 2004, these being The Visitation, Pyramids of Mars, The Green Death, The Leisure Hive, Ghost Light, and the rather special release, Lost in Time. This would be something of an essential title when it came to orphan episodes. Across three discs, it contained 18 surviving episodes from a variety of partially missing stories from across the first and second Doctor's eras. Whilst today the set is mostly obsolete, either due to episode recoveries or animations, the importance and impact this set had 
cannot be understated. Just like 2003, only five new tales featuring the Eighth Doctor were published by BBC Books. These were Sometime Never, Half-Life, The Tomorrow Windows, The Sleep of Reason, and The Dead Stone Memorial. There were also five new stories for Doctors 1-7, to these being Empire of Death, The Eleventh Tiger, Synth Espions, The Algebra of Ice, and The Indestructible Man. With production of a brand new television series on the way, some fans began to speculate whether BBC books were slowly winding down both ranges, with the hope that perhaps new books featuring the brand new Doctor would be coming down the pipeline as a replacement. They'd have to wait until the following year to truly find out that answer. Meanwhile at Big Finish, more monthly audio dramas came trundling onto CD. 2004's offerings being The Creed of the Crowman, The Natural History of Fear, The Twilight Kingdom, The Axis of Insanity, Arrangements for War, The Harvest, The Roof of the World, Medicinal Purposes, Faith Stealer, The Last, Keodroya, and The Next Life. Many of this year's releases continued the ongoing Eighth Doctor storyline, and it's one I highly recommend if you haven't heard it before. But just like with the BBC books, some wondered just how long Big Finish could continue making original adventures with past Doctors. After all, with the Ninth Doctor debuting on TV screen soon, the BBC could decide to revoke the license from Big Finish, choosing to focusing on producing multimedia content solely based on the new series. Once again, fans and to some extent Big Finish themselves would have to wait another year before they would get their answer. Spring 2004 would herald many milestone moments in anticipation of the new series. First and foremost, it was announced that Christopher Eccleston would be taking control of the TARDIS, portraying what Russell definitively termed as the Ninth Doctor. This statement finally dispelled confusion or discussion that Richard E. Grant's incarnation from Scream of the Schalke was the official Ninth Doctor. This latter version would be assigned an alternative status. There had been rumours, long before Schalke even, that Grant was in contention for playing the Doctor on TV. Russell dispelled this outright in an interview, saying, I thought he was terrible. I thought he took the money and ran, to be honest. He was never on our list to play the Doctor. With the Ninth Doctor now firmly in place, production on the first new series of Doctor Who in 15 years began, with a transmission date due for the spring of 2005. There's a lot to say regarding the casting of the Doctor and their new companion, as well as several other aspects, but naturally, we'll be saving that for next time. Rather oddly, there was just one instance of Doctor Who being screened on one of the main BBC channels during 2004. This was episode one of The Web of Fear, at that time the only surviving episode of that story. It was screened in late June 2004 on BBC4, another of the Beeb's digital channels that had launched in 2002. The reason for its showing was as part of a series of classic 60s sci-fi and fantasy repeats originally made by the BBC. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any reliable or concrete ratings data for this repeat, but regardless, it's nice to see that the episode was included, representing Doctor Who as one of the top examples of 60s sci-fi the BBC had made. As interesting as this repeat is, it was definitely overshadowed by the overwhelming joy that brand new Doctor Who would be transmitted in just a year's time. So as 2004 drew to a close, fans old and new could rest easy that the following year, in 2005, Doctor Who would finally, after long last, be returning to television as a series. Not a charity special, not a TV movie, a full-on 13-episode series. But let's take a moment to touch on just how crucial the wilderness years were. When long-running shows enter a dark period, with no new material produced on the small screen, it can be all too common that any interest in the franchise will ebb away and die out. But Doctor Who was built different. Having kept its flame alive in the first half of the 90s, with books, VHS releases and the ever-faithful Doctor Who magazine, the programme sustained an interest that carried up until the TV movie. When that sadly didn't turn into a full series, the stakes for Doctor Who were raised even higher. Many thought it had had its second chance, that to get a third was pretty much impossible. But the train continued on. More videos and then DVDs from the BBC, original new adventures from the Beeb and Big Finish on audio, all to keep the spirit and legacy of this silly little sci-fi show alive and well in the hearts and minds of the many it had connected with. There's numerous factors you can attribute to the show's eventual comeback, but arguably one of the most important ones is the fans. Without the fans' enthusiasm and dedication, buying the home media releases, reading the books, listening to the audios, etc., there's every chance that the BBC may have decided never to have taken a chance on Doctor Who again. So if you were one of those fans who endured the never-ending doubt of the wilderness years, first or second time around, then I salute you, because without you, 
Doctor Who may not be the renewed cultural institution that it very much is today. So those are the ratings details for the wilderness years. I hope you've enjoyed delving into this dark period for Doctor Who, and though its presence on television may have been somewhat limited, it never truly died out, thriving in one medium or another. If you want to read more about Doctor Who and the making of it, then I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts of the wilderness years in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we'll see you next time for a whole new era of Doctor Who.